Westminster, the one and only Tom Swarbrick. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Morning all, welcome to the show. At 10 o'clock... My wife and boy will be out in a second. You just leave them, all, them alone, yeah? yeah no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Split down the middle. I think that there's, that there's definitely a couple of opportunities um, for Boris Johnson to do a lot of listening to the party, to show leadership. After months of tension, Downing Street divides. Senior aides, including Cummings, leave abruptly. The Prime Minister apparently hurt by barbs made by staff about his fiancée, who is accused of attempting to run the government by WhatsApp. There are always tensions at the heart of government, but the stories this morning are more reminiscent of the school playground. Can Boris Johnson reset his government? Is it too late for all that? Swarbrick on Sunday starts after the news at 10. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 10 o'clock, senior Tories say Boris Johnson needs to get a grip on Downing Street after a power struggle saw two close aides of the Prime Minister leave his administration. Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane both left number 10 this week after a breakdown of their relationship with Mr Johnson. Ireland's Foreign Minister Simon Coveney says despite the distractions this week, the departures will have no impact on Brexit negotiations over the next few days. That's really a matter for the Prime Minister. Uh, he's the decision maker here for Britain. Um, uh, David Frost is still the key negotiator. Uh, and so, you know, regardless of who is advising the Prime Minister in terms of how to finalise a deal here, which is hopefully the space we'll be in this week, uh, the EU will remain consistent and respectful uh, of Britain. Labour claims anti-vaccination groups are churning out disinformation online weeks before a coronavirus jab could be rolled out. The party is calling on the government to bring in emergency legislation to help stamp out the content. Shadow Health Secretary Jonathan Ashworth says it can be extremely dangerous. Poison, garbage that is spread, conspiracy theories suggesting that the vaccine is being developed by big global business people who want to use it to insert microchips into people. It is all nonsense. And the the anti-vaccine campaigns erode trust and they play on distrust on public institutions. At least 20 people have been arrested at a Donald Trump rally in Washington, D.C. Protesters turned out to show their support for the U.S. president's unfounded claims that the election was rigged. One person was stabbed and two police officers were injured. A survey has found around two and a half million households in the UK are worried about paying rent over the winter. The research by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation estimates 700,000 homes are already in arrears and around half that number are at risk of eviction. The group is warning that without targeted support, renters who've seen incomes drop will be at risk of losing their homes. And Des O'Connor has died at the age of 88. His agent says he was admitted to hospital last week following a fall at his home in Buckinghamshire and died last night. Our entertainment editor, Charlie Gerling, says he was not only a TV personality, but also a musician. He recorded 36 albums as a singer, which is uh, quite prodigious given his incredible television career as well, five of which uh, reached the UK top 40. So hugely varied as a performer, as an entertainer. You know, he was best known, I think, certainly recently for things like Countdown. Um, But he had an incredibly long and varied career. So a a really sad loss. The weather, blustery showers and rain moving northeast across the country today. Some persistent rain for Northern Ireland and southeast England. Winds easing across Scotland, but staying windy elsewhere, particularly in the south. A high of 14 Celsius. From Global's newsroom, I'm Holly Harris.
is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. Just gone 10. Hello, good morning and welcome to the show. You are listening to and watching Swarbrick on Sunday live here on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you very well this Sunday morning. Coming up, a vaccine not far off. But neither are the anti-vaxxers. Security services said to be worried about disinformation and the criminal gangs who are attempting to sell fake vaccines. MPs have already taken evidence that the government also has the power to make the vaccine compulsory. We'll debate that suggestion with a professor who likens the vaccine to your car seatbelt. That's later. Also this morning, Labour's Shadow Culture Secretary Joe Stevens joins us and George Eustace, the Environment Secretary, as Boris Johnson plans a big speech on going green at the start of next week. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good morning to you and talking of Boris Johnson, it would seem that the final straw for the Prime Minister when it came to his two senior advisers was the description by Dominic Cummings of Johnson's fiancée Carrie Simmons as Princess Nutnuts. The PM reportedly chastising Cummings and Kane for the briefings to the press against his betrothed. Both men now out of that big black door, Downing Street in a form of disarray, really, descriptions of a poisonous atmosphere in which too much power was concentrated in the hands of people whose first interest did not seem to be the country's. There are always tensions at the top of government, but it is not always this, seemingly this, dysfunctional. And the impact on Johnson's government could be terminal. There is even a Downing Street staff member in the papers today, anonymously of course, suggesting they don't think their boss will be Prime Minister this time next year. I wonder whether you think Boris Johnson can indeed reset his government. If so, a reset to what? Talk of Boris Johnson going green, being a bit more consensual, dropping the sort of the culture wars. Did you vote for Boris Johnson because you wanted him to be nice? 0345 6060 973 is my number. Let's get straight to it. Six minutes past ten. Lord Gavin Barwell joins us. Conservative peer, former Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Theresa May between 2017 and 2019. Great to see you on the programme, Lord Barwell. Thank you for being there for us. Um, first of all, your take on what's been an astonishing week of briefings and counter-briefings in Downing Street. Did you think it would ever be this dysfunctional? Well, I think given the, the scale of the challenges that the country faces at the moment, we're still in the middle of the pandemic and we've got the Brexit negotiations just coming to their end. Uh, this is clearly not the moment when the Prime Minister would have wanted a week like the one we've just had. But as you were saying in your introduction, I do think it gives him an opportunity for a reset. He can try and get a more effective, harmonious team around him in number 10. Uh, he can try and get a better relationship with Conservative MPs, which I don't think has been in the right place for the last few months. Uh, and also, as you were saying, maybe strike a slightly more unifying, uh, less confrontational tone, which I think is probably more in tune with his underlying character. Now, if you don't mind me saying, I'm going to let listeners in on a little secret here, because you yeah. were the chief of staff in number 10 when I was in number 10. And in, in fact, you are, I think you are sort of uh, describing the things that you had to do when you came into number 10 after the general election of 2017, which went very badly wrong for Theresa May um, and enforced a reset, really, of her government at that stage. Tell us what you did. Describe what you did in number 10 to engender a reset to make it more consensual. So uh, it was a very strange situation for me because I'd worked closely with one of my predecessors, Nick Timothy, who I had a very high regard for. But when I came into the building, it was clear that the atmosphere in there was not right at all, that, that it had been a little bit similar to what we've seen this week, a, a pretty poisonous and unpleasant atmosphere. So my starting point in doing the job was number 10, as you know, Tom, is always going to be a stressful, difficult place to work. That's inevitable. But it doesn't have to be an unpleasant place to work. And I think that the number one job of the chief of staff is to try and get this very disparate group of political advisors who might have different views about what they think the prime minister should do and the civil servants that work there and create a single effective uh, team uh, between them. And I'd like to think for all the troubles we had in the two years I was there, and obviously we didn't ultimately get Brexit done, which is what we were trying to do. But I do feel that we did develop a good team spirit, that we worked together as one team to do our best to try and support Prime Minister, and that is a key part of the mm. job. And, and if, I, if you've got time for one other quick thought, 
I always felt that the, the, the job title, chief of staff, the important word was staff, not chief, that you're not there to try and get your agenda pushed through. You don't have any democratic mandate from the electorate. You're there to try and help the prime minister get what he or she wants done, uh, delivered, and to get the whole government machine working for what the prime minister is trying to achieve. And I just wonder whether the chief consideration now, to use that word that shouldn't be used first, but the chief consideration now is not the test of loyalty, which seems to be the prized asset amongst uh, Johnson advisors at the moment, that they have to be loyal. Loyalty is, is obviously a great thing to be and, and it's a rare commodity in politics, but actually effectiveness is what counts. And as you've described, you, you, it's, you're able to build a team that is, yes, loyal and has that sense of purpose, but actually is, is effective in doing what it's doing. And arguably the thing that Boris Johnson's government has failed to be uh, of late is effective. Yes, yeah, so I think obviously you've got to believe in what the Prime Minister is trying to do. You wouldn't want to work for the Prime Minister if that wasn't true. true. But then actually you need a range of voices. You, you don't want everyone having exactly the same opinion. And uh, you want to try and ensure that the Prime Minister is getting all the different perspectives that he or she needs uh, to, to make the difficult decisions Prime Ministers have to take day in, day out. But then, as you say, also the test is, uh, is one of effectiveness. Are you able to translate those decisions into a, into action by the government machine to deliver those policies? And that is another key aspect of the job. So as well as building back relations with Conservative MPs, what do you think Boris Johnson needs to talk about to show to the country, to show to voters that he maybe is changing from a, a slightly more confrontational, acrimonious premiership of late? So I think a lot of it is more change of tone uh, than change of uh, policy specifically. He's got to deliver on the manifesto that he stood, right? The, the critical thing as we, uh, as hopefully as we go into the new year and we get over this second wave of the pandemic, he's got to focus on the levelling up agenda, which was at the core of the manifesto on which he won that enormous victory at, uh, less than a year ago now. Uh, so those, those policies that were set out in that manifesto, that's the key thing. But it's sometimes felt like the government has been almost unnecessarily confrontational, wanting to take on all sorts of institutions in the country. And actually, you need to work with people often and, and persuade them of your case and, and make them be agents of change uh, with you. So I think it's as much a change of tone and style uh, as you can't try and change the electoral coalition that you've won the election on and you've got to deliver the things that you promised to them in that manifesto. Do you think finally, just as there has been a change at the top of, of Boris Johnson's advisers, do you think there needs to be a bit of a cabinet reshuffle as well to, to absolutely nail home that change? Well, it's, look, it's not, that's not my business ultimately. It's a decision for the Prime Minister. Uh, as to who he <laughs> but it would help, wouldn't it, to get rid of some of the people but that have been seen as being a bit confrontational? Some... Yeah, well, so I don't want to single out particular individuals, but I do think there are some very experienced people in the Conservative Party that have proven themselves effective ministers that are currently sitting on the back benches. And we're in the middle still of a national crisis. And I think it would help the Prime Minister if he brought some of that experience uh, back into government. But ultimately, those personnel decisions are ones he has to take. He has to be comfortable not just with the people around him in number 10, the advisor team, but the ministers who are supporting him as well. Perhaps even yourself, Lord Barwell. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Gavin Barwell, Conservative peer, former Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Theresa May from 2017 to 2019. I wonder if an, a nicer, more consensual, fluffier Boris Johnson is what is needed, not only within the Conservative Party, for whatever that matters, and it does matter to Boris Johnson still, despite the majority of over 80, but what that says to people, in the, people, people who previously voted for him, who now look at his government and think, Ksh, these guys are having a laugh. This isn't serious government. The stuff in the papers over the last few days is playground politics. It's not the serious politics of a prime minister on top of his game who's in charge of his uh, staff members who is trying to run the country at an incredibly difficult time. Can Boris Johnson do something to persuade you to vote for him again? Or, as one of the advisers that he is trying to persuade to stay on his team suggests in one of the papers today, is he done? I mean, give it 12 months, this advisor suggests, and he won't be there. Do you think that's true? 0345 6060 973. Let's get straight to your calls. Here's Delroy in Brixton this morning. Hiya, Delroy. Morning, Tom. How are you, mate? I'm very well. Do you think he can reset? Nope. I think he's over. He's cooked, <laughs> his goose, he's finished, and Princess Nutnuts is the cause of it. Apparently, Princess Nutnuts, a.k.a. 
uh, Carrie Simons, uh, is a, 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 an apprentice of the Clinton Foundation, if you do your Wikipedias. So she's oh, an arch remainer. Right. I just don't think arch remainer. I don't think she's what the, the the red wall voted for. I think he'll be gone within a year. Don't know who will replace him though. No idea. I think the 1922 committee will have something to say about that. When you talk um, about when you talk about the red wall, yeah, um, and and that flipped to become a bit of a blue wall during the 2019 yep. election. What was it that they yep. voted for Boris Johnson that they might that they fear is going to be changed as a result of any kind of reset that's coming? What are you losing on, here? I think they'll be feeling the red wall. Feel he's going soft on Brexit. I mean, there's already been talk about compromises with Barnier over the fishing uh, rights around the British waters. That's in the Express it every day. It's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think people just think that he's not... He doesn't have to be hardcore to be a true Brexiteer. And I think a lot of people thought that Nigel Farage, let him or hate him, stood aside to allow the 80-seat uh, majority uh, Conservative victory last December. So I think that, you know, he's on borrowed time. And if he starts being seen to be booted out... He only won uh, an 80-seat majority not, not yeah. even a year ago. We can't really be saying that he's on borrowed time already, can we? Well, yes, absolutely we can, Tom, for that very reason that he's seen, he seems to be going soft on, on you know, the, the take-back control bit. He just doesn't seem to be the, the Boris that I think the Red Wall hoped he would be and couldn't really bring themselves to, well, Brexit Party, as you know, it mm. withdrew many of the northern seats, mm -hmm. so it wasn't available to be voted for. So there was only really, the only true Brexit party available was the Tories. They didn't want to vote Tory. They'd never, they probably would never right. vote again. And I think... Well, let's you know, see if people should, agree with you, yeah. Delroy, because I think it's a it's a it's a big call to make to suggest that an 80 seat strong uh, prime minister is now on the ropes after less than a year in charge. But I agree with you that and the the, the phrasing of it is a terrible phrase, but the, the kind of go woke, go broke view that if Boris Johnson ta starts to turn to slightly fluffier issues, drops the culture war stuff, then people who voted for him perhaps for the first time are going to be very, very disappointed. If that's you, would you be disappointed if Boris Johnson dropped what's seen as a very hard line with the EU? 0345 6060973. We'll speak to David Davis, the former Brexit secretary, in just a few moments as well. Tom Swarbrick, Swarbrick on Sunday. It's 1016. This is LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster on LBC. Very good morning to you. You're reacting to five days of absolutely dreadful headlines for number 10, given the internecine warfare that's been going on behind that big black door. Phillips in pool this morning, 84850. Tom, number 10 is beginning to remind me of a sixth form study at a public school where the prefects hatch plots against those they dislike, brackets, says Philip. I went to a public school. Um, just because Cummings and his mate have gone doesn't mean Brexit has stopped. The people who wanted them gone appear to be keen on Brexit. People need to calm down says this text, uh, Cummings was nothing special, just fairly good at marketing and someone with access to data from social media. Even then, policies were all over the place, moving around depending on focus group responses. We'll speak to a cabinet minister in just a few moments. David Davis will join us too. Let me just run you through the front pages of this morning's papers, though, first here on Swarbrick on Sunday. Um, we start with lbc.co.uk lbc.co.uk Boris takes back control after Cummings exit you can also see uh, Dominic Cummings leaving his home yesterday as the cameras snapped him making an exit from another door uh, the Sunday Times this morning lobbyists given secret access to Covid meetings chumocracy row at the heart of government this is another investigation done by the newspaper this week that looks at the involvement of lobbyists in some quite sensitive meetings around test track and trace uh, this time uh, the chairman of Portland Communications seems to be involved. The Sunday Telegraph, Downing Street slams vicious and cowardly attacks on Simmons. This is the PM's fiance. Number 10 hits back after inflammatory claims that Johnson's fiance is trying to run government by WhatsApp. Uh, the Observer, attacks by PM's ousted aide left new press chief in tears. This is now Allegra Stratton, for those of you who are <laughs> deep in the weeds of this and following the personnel movements of Number 10, Allegra Stratton, the Prime Minister's new press secretary. Uh, outside number 10 yesterday. I've got to say, I just think this, this commentary on particularly women in very senior roles crying, um, I just find it slightly misogynistic, to be honest with you. Uh, the Mail on Sunday, Palace anger at TV's crown, Charles Friends cool drama trolling on a Hollywood budget, the Sunday Mirror, Princess Nut Nut's cruel nickname for Carrie that led to downfall of Cummings again. It's funny, isn't it? Papers on the left seem to be slightly going for women on the right. There you go. Sunday Express. Hold your nerve, Boris. Brexiteers back PM after Cummings' exit as he tells them there'll be no backsliding over deal. The Daily Star. Celeb Bev. I ain't afraid of no ghost. Corrie legend Beverly Callard ready to tackle I'm a Celebrity's haunted castle with the help of Didri Barlow's ghost. <laughs> no, me neither. Uh, and the Sunday people, Ripper's last weasel words, self-pitying beast Peter Sutcliffe whined, I'm not going to make it, I'm sorry, shortly before his death. Uh, let's turn to David Davis now, the Conservative MP for Holton Price and Howden, former Brexit Secretary. Thank you for being there for us, Mr Davis. Good to see you this morning. Let's start with Morning. this reset, so-called, of, of Johnson's government. Uh, we've just heard from Lord Gavin Barwell there, former Chief of Staff to Theresa May, someone you worked with in government, saying that maybe some of those experienced backbench MPs could be brought back into government. Would you identify who you might like to see back round the Cabinet table? <laughs> you want me to kill their careers completely, do you? Uh, well, look, there, 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 there are a lot of people on the back benches who, I mean, bluntly, you've got the A-team on the back benches. You know, you've got the... Uh, the uh, Jeremy Hunt, who was uh, you know who was the last uh, the last man standing other than Boris in the leadership campaign. You've got Greg Clark. You've got Damien Green. You've got a whole series of people, Liam Fox, uh, who are proven cabinet ministers uh, who could have added a bit of weight to the cabinet in the last uh, uh, in the last nine months or so. So yeah, there are plenty of people who could be brought back. This is the old guard, though. To, to come back on that a moment, this is why why see the return of the old guard? Let's let's have some new blood coming into the cabinet. It's again, it's what some of those now blue wall voters perhaps voted for. They didn't vote vote for the old people. Well, they did. I mean, the the, the, the truth is, I mean, how many of the current cabinet do you think were known to the electorate at the last election? Uh, like zero, or other than Boris? I mean, none. Um, uh, so I don't. I wouldn't accept that. Also, the truth is. You know, politics is, uh, to a very large extent, requires experience. It requires having been here before sometimes. And uh, it's, you know, this is a very unusually young cabinet. I mean, I'm not particularly picking on any of them, but it's a very young and comparatively inexperienced cabinet. Oh, go on. And one, <laughs> and one, one of the, 
uh, one of the problems in the last year is all of them effectively have been learning their job. That's not a criticism of them. You know, a new person into a into a very difficult job, and every single cabinet post is a difficult job, uh, uh, has to learn their way. And while they're doing that, the, the worst crisis in the world uh, hit them. So hardly, I, I hardly think it's a, it's a unfair to say they've had a hard time. What has the Johnson government lacked up until this point that maybe the, the comings and goings of this week might be able to, to be brought forward? Well, I think the simple truth is that the last year has not been very good in terms of just a simple operational running of government. I mean, Downing Street has not been very functional. We've had, the, the, What we've seen this week is an exaggerated form of the internal warfare, you called it the internecine warfare, it's been going on all year. I mean, you know, uh, you know we, we, if we cast our mind back, you know, SPAD special advisors being marched out the front door with police escorts, you know, all sorts of briefing one way or another, one camp against another. Why does that matter to my <laughs> listeners? Why does that matter to, I mean, it's, it's interesting for the comings and goings of, of political reporting and sort of intrigue about what's going on behind the door of number 10, but why does that matter to, to voters, do you think? Well, it, it matters because what should be happening is the people making all that noise should be focusing on doing the job. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the simple truth is that during the course of the coronavirus uh, crisis, there have been a lot of mistakes. Now, some are unavoidable. I mean, you know, when you're facing something as big as this and something as new as this, then you're going to have mistakes made. And I think the public understand that. I mean, you know, the 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 whole ratings of the government have been comparatively robust uh, uh, over the course of the year because the public understand this is difficult. But we've also had a lot of unforced errors, a lot of mistakes that weren't necessary to make, that were foreseeable, predictable and so on. And that's why it matters to your listeners because they want to get back to work. They want their economy to be working. They want to be safe. And all of those things uh, have been jeopardised from time to time. Let me ask you about coronavirus, because I know you've taken a, a long-standing interest in, in pandemics and, and being able to tackle pandemics. I want to bring you the words of Dame Sally Davis, former chief medical officer, who um, was speaking in the week, saying that the government was, to, or she was told by government officials that a coronavirus from Asia would never travel this far. She said she asked health experts whether the country should rehearse for an outbreak of a coronavirus in 2015, but was told by Public Health England officials that coronavirus, a coronavirus, would never reach the UK in large numbers. I wonder what you make of that. Well, uh, Dame Sally Davis is probably one of our best ever chief medical officers. She really had a grip on the on the big issues. Uh, and I'm not surprised she asked. But what it tells you bluntly is the really low caliber of planning that was uh, done for any pandemic, frankly, not just coronavirus, but coronavirus as well. Uh, and it, this dates back a decade. I mean, uh, some of it uh, uh, you can see in the poor quality of Public Health England administration and decisions. They wrecked basically the uh, the testing. Uh, a project. I mean, they were the ones who put it in such uh, in a bad place right at the beginning. Uh, but th th there's been problems like this right across Whitehall uh, and dating back years. You were Was in pandemic you were, planning. Ever? Yeah, go on. Well, I'm going to say you, you were you were you can't you can't talk about it because you're bound by the Official Secrets Act. But but you were sitting round uh, the the walls of the of the cabinet when we discussed the thing called exercise sickness, which for your for your readers was the last time we had a big pandemic planning exercise. It was a, uh, and uh, at the time I said, uh, as you may remember, I said, you know, this is so important. We should have a full cabinet on nothing but this and go through it because it's the worst threat to our, comp uh, our country. Uh, and we were supposed to do that. It never happened. It never happened. Why not? You know, it were it, it and that exercise itself demonstrated how bad we were uh, at at handling this. It presumed a 450,000 death rate. It was basically an exercise in, in planning more. Why do you think it didn't happen? Why did I, I don't know. I think distraction. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the simple truth was that, you know, whilst everybody nodded sagely at, 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 at my comments, I don't know how many of them actually thought through the numbers, thought through what the real implications were. I mean, if we had had, imagine, look, we are in a terrible situation now in terms of the economy, but imagine how, how it would have been if it had been 450,000 deaths, which is, mm. which is what they were sort of just assuming, well, let's, let's work out how we deal with that. Not 
How do we prevent it? How do we stop it happening? What are the risk points? All of that stuff. And we were supposed to be one of the best prepared countries in the world. We were nothing nothing like the best prepared country in the world. Mm. David Davis, always good to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Conservative MP for Holton Price and Howden, former Brexit secretary. Let's get Simon in Orpington on the radio this morning. Hi, Simon. <laughs> Tom, good morning. I hope you're well. Um, yeah, I thought it was fascinating listening to Lord Barwell there, uh, who you had on earlier. Lord Bar- Barwell, who helped Mrs May lose her majority, he himself lost well, his Well, to seat. be fair, actually, Simon, he wasn't in number 10 during the uh, 2017 general election. So let's, let's make the people who were in number 10 at the time Tom, he, was, he was a pivotal person. He, was he, always, wasn't, he, was he always... wasn't during... He wasn't... Simon, honestly, I, I know this because I was there. He was not the chief of staff during the 2017 election. But carry okay, on, my friend. But he was, he was in the media regularly speaking for her. Uh, he himself lost his seat at the 2017 election. He was rewarded for failure in a place in the House of Lords. And he's now given Boris Johnson advice on how to appeal, the, to, appeal to the electorate. You just couldn't make it up, could you? Look, the problem is Boris Johnson has no conviction. Lord Barwell is saying there, soften things up, go a bit greener, go a bit softer and go for the centre. Margaret Thatcher won three elections from the right of politics, but the difference is that she knew what she stood for. And I don't believe yes. Boris Johnson does. I There's think he's um... done. Oh, really? I, I totally. Look, Tom, he won the last election by saying get Brexit done, and that was right. That was what the um, attitude of the country was for. And also by saying I'm not Jeremy Corbyn. He hasn't got that next time around. And Conservatives who have voted for him, I think, are really disappointed that he is moving to the centre, that he is going uh, for this green agenda. And I think the issue with you know Dominic Cummings going is Boris Johnson is a weak person, doesn't know what he stands for. Therefore, Dominic Cummings could have too much influence. But that's not Cummings' fault. That's Boris Johnson's fault. When there's a leadership vacuum, someone will always fill it. And the concern now is that it could be Carrie Simons. I I read the uh, description, and I don't, you know, it's there in the newspapers this morning, of... Uh, Boris Johnson telling Dominic Cummings to apologise for that trip to Barnard Castle. Bor- um, Dominic Cummings saying, no, I'm not going to apologise, and then nothing happened. I mean, I find that absolutely astonishing that an advisor to the Prime Minister, however senior that advisor is, can tell the Prime Minister no, and and not have any consequence, seemingly. Tom, absolutely. When Dominic Cummings became centre, and that story went on for about four days, that was the point to fire him. That's when I realised how weak Boris Johnson is as a leader. And I think he knows that himself. There's no way he's got another election in him. And I think um, Conservatives like myself just won't vote for him again. If there was an election call tomorrow, I would have two options. Either don't vote, which I wouldn't want to do, or even, and as a small C conservative, vote for Keir Starmer. Because even though I'm not of the left, if they both take the place of the centre, I may as well vote on competence. And that is, Simon, as a is lifelong it, small yeah. C conservative, well, if, the Conservative if, Party better wake up. And if Keir Starmer is able to occupy the centre and if Boris Johnson moves there, then the, as you say, the, if the distinguishing feature, feature is then their effectiveness, then I can see why you might do and why others may well too. Simon, thank you. 0345 973 We'll speak to Labour in a few moments' time. We'll be joined by their Shadow Culture Minister. First, though, we'll hear from the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs about going green. George Eustace will join us in a few moments. Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC 1033 News Headlines. Holly Harris. Senior Tories say the recent departure of two close aides from Downing Street is the ideal opportunity for Boris Johnson to reset his relationship with his team and his party. Lord Gavin Barwell's told LBC the Prime Minister can try a more unified approach now that Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane have left. Ministers insist they've secured a major commitment from Facebook, Twitter and Google to tackle anti-vaccination fake news news. Labour is calling for new laws to clamp down on the issue. And Des O'Connor has died at the age of 88. He was taken to hospital just over a week ago after a fall at his home in Buckinghamshire. The weather, blustery showers and rain moving northeast across the country this afternoon. The wind easing in Scotland but staying windy elsewhere. A high of 14 Celsius. LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Text 84850. Here's Paul in Brentford this morning. Tom, if Boris had fired Cummings after Barnard Castle, he'd still be holding some respect from the public. It's the big event that the public won't forgive or forget, says Paul. We'll come on to that in a few moments because I'm joined by George Eustace, Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Conservative MP for Camborne and Red Roof. Thank you very much for coming on the programme this morning, Secretary of State. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that we'll talk about Dominic Cummings in just a moment. Uh, but let's let's start with Brexit, because this is a big moment in the Brexit discussions. Uh, you've said this morning that, quote, both sides recognise time is short and there does come a point where businesses needs to know a deadline. This needs to be a week when things move because otherwise time is running out. What needs to move? Well, the European Union need to uh, change their position. There are two key sticking points, really. Uh, one is that Although we're becoming an independent country, the EU's position is that they'd like in perpetuity to enjoy all of the access that they have to our waters and to have the, the current sort of sharing arrangement or something not dissimilar to it. And that's not something that any normal independent country would do. And the second thing is that they would like us to be part of their state aid regime. And again, that's just not precedented anywhere else in the world. So we're our request really our ask is for uh, something that's got precedence in fisheries there's precedence in terms of how these things should work uh, with norway uh, and on uh, things like state aid and level playing field provisions there are precedents in things like the eu canada agreement we're just asking for those types of agreements it's not that extraordinary make it sound very simple. I wonder if by the end of this week, if things haven't moved in a way in which the UK government likes, then Boris Johnson will take a decision that that's the end of it. Well, I don't know. And, um, you know, obviously we'll have to see how it goes. It's a possibility, right? Well, it is, because, of course, the Prime Minister you know, initially said that we needed to uh, aim to have this done and dusted by the middle of October. Um, always with these things, uh, if there's uh, goodwill and progress is being made, you can always make a, uh, a judgment call that it's um, worth going for another, another mm-hmm. week or another few days to try to get there. But I think both sides, um, Simon Coveney said this this morning, both sides recognise that we, uh, as we, as we get towards the second half of November, Uh, it does start to become the case that um, you've got to make a decision one way or the other and either you know make get the momentum necessary to finalize uh, remaining issues um, or accept that there won't be a further negotiated outcome and give business time to prepare for that yes and (laughs) you know with a with with a month and a bit to go they really need some time to prepare um so let's say the state aid thing is is moved upon. That leaves the, the issue of fishing. Now, I realise for many communities this is a really big problem, but this is 0.1% of our GDP. You can't possibly be suggesting that we will blow up the possibility of a trade deal for 0.1% of GDP. That makes no sense. Well, the first thing is it's uh, it's very important to those coastal communities uh, right around our, our country. But secondly, there's an important principle here as well. And we don't say to the EU, you can have all of the oil uh, that's in the North Sea, uh, go ahead, um, uh, you just, just take it. Um, fisheries is a resource that's in our uh, exclusive economic zone. And there's an important principle here that as an independent country, Every independent country in the world manages its uh, exclusive economic zone. That's out to 200 miles or the halfway point. That's a fundamental tenet of international law. And to really, but if it was um, a choice between the, fi- the principle, gonna... if it was a choice between the principle of that or a deal, you're saying that the government at the moment is inclined to stick to that principle. The, the government, we're very clear that yes, on fisheries, and we're not asking for anything extraordinary, but it's important that we. Uh, at least are able to operate as Norway does and to be able to control our own waters. Um, We've not really become properly independent uh, if we didn't have control of our waters. Okay, let me ask you about the the new national parks and thousands of green jobs that uh, you're looking to create under this plan to build back greener. The Prime Minister is going to be giving a speech later this week. Um, How important is this part of the government's agenda now, particularly given Joe Biden is going to become president in the United States and has a clear focus on climate? 
Well, look, this has always been important for the government. We had a number of manifesto commitments in this area. Uh, when I took this job, the Prime Minister was clear with me that he wanted me uh, to really make the most of COP26 uh, next year yes. and to advance the environmental agenda. So it's not a change for us in that sense. But it is the case that uh, with a Biden administration due to come in uh, in the US, um, all of the mood music uh, from the Biden camp to date is that they will re-engage uh, with the uh, COP process and rejoin that uh, and re-engage with a lot of other multilateral So this is uh, a big chance to make a big impression on Joe Biden. Big chance here I, for, the, for Boris Johnson's government. I think there is a, a great opportunity with us hosting COP26 next year, yes, um, and with the United States re-engaging on, uh, on this issue, being clear that they take climate change seriously, that they want to rejoin um, the, the COP process. I think that's all yeah. positive and we look forward to working with them on that. Just very finally on this, there are some backbenchers who are angling for a big statesman figure to be chairing COP26. At the moment, it's the business secretary, Alok Sharma, no slight against your cabinet colleague. But um, how would you feel about, and some backbenchers have already spoken about this, David Cameron being brought back in to chair COP26? Would that be something that you would like to see happen? Uh, look, I uh, was an advisor to, to David Cameron way back in the early days. Um, uh, and so uh, he's got many strengths and um, I'm a big supporter of him and he was very passionate about the environment. He'd agenda. be good, wouldn't he? But, um, well, he'd be good in lots of roles, but uh, there isn't a vacancy on this role uh, at the moment. Uh, the truth of the matter is we've got uh, Alok Sharma who's doing a fantastic job there. Um, a decision was taken quite early on, actually, that it was important that you had a uh, cabinet minister leading on this portfolio, chairing it. Um, that's mm. um, a decision, I think, that was the right decision, and I'm working very closely with Alok on it. We'll wait and see. Let's talk about Dominic Cummings. Um, the atmosphere in Number 10 has been utterly toxic, if we believe what, what has been read, and indeed speaking to people who were working in there, it, it sounds horrific. The Prime Minister must have known. What does it say about his character that he allowed it to continue for so long? Well, I don't know that it is. There's obviously been some toxic briefings, uh, but fundamentally what's happened here is... You think everything's OK in there? Uh, well, look, there's been um, obviously an episode that um, partly could have been a, a disagreement over certain roles, and that's the prerogative of any Prime Minister to be able to choose their advisers. Uh, in any Prime Minister's office, there are three key roles. You've got a chief of staff who uh, needs to try to uh, do the engagement and is usually quite cautious and tries to keep people well, happy. Well, we haven't seen that. I mean, this is a guy, Dominic fences. Cummings, who apparently, who apparently mimes throwing grenades into rooms that he's leaving and ignores the Prime Minister's texts and gloats about it. That's a... You must be astonished well, okay. to read that. I have not immersed myself in the gossip. I've read it, yes. I don't know whether it's true or not true. But look, Dominic Cummings was You have wasn't no understanding of the workings of Number 10 right now as a cabinet I minister. do understand. So you have three key roles, they're saying, a chief of staff. Uh, then you have a director of strategy, and that's the role that Dominic Cummings has been performing. Uh, those people are really to make sure that you've got some strategic purposes to go. Well, it's not their job to uh, build bridges or mend fences or uh, engage with Parliament. That's something that the chief whip does. And then you have a, mm. a press secretary role which is also the, the key third role in any prime minister's office. So the prime minister's now got to replace all three of those and uh, he's got to have a, a balanced um, mix of those three. They'll all be the fundamentally very different individuals. Of the prime minister's fiance as princess and nut nuts. I mean, this is, this is school ground stuff, Secretary of State. This is embarrassing for a number 10 that is dealing with the biggest peacetime crisis this country has faced. Well, as I said, I've not immersed myself in um, the gossip of this and who called who, what names, whether people were upset or whether they cried. You know, from my point of view as a cabinet minister, there's been an episode involving personnel uh, at number 10. The prime minister has taken a decision that he wants to change mm. the balances of advisers. But, you know, this is about advisers to the prime minister. It is not uh, well, let me not ask about, you about the government. decisiveness. Yeah, let me ask you about decisiveness just finally, because the claim is that Boris Johnson is indecisive, that a decision gets made one minute and then he wanders back up to the Downing Street flat and it gets undone the next. Um, what, what decision has the government made that it has stuck to in the last few months? There will be well, many, many decisions that, uh, that we've made and that we've uh, stuck to. Um, we've made a decision to, to do this latest lockdown and we're sticking to that. Uh, and that will last Having previously said that a lockdown December. wasn't going to happen, that he, would, he couldn't countenance a second lockdown. He changed on that big time. It, it changed on that because the situation changed, uh, but we've now got that lockdown until uh, the but second The Prime Minister is decisive, uh, right? He's a, he's a man who knows his mind and sticks to it. 
Yes, um, he is. And uh, uh, he does Which is interesting because, again, like on the front page these... of the Sunday Telegraph, sorry to interrupt, but plans to unleash a new generation of homes across England using an ill-conceived algorithm of being overhauled amid the threat of seismic rebellion by Conservative MPs. That's Robert Jenrick's plan. That's being torn up. I see that the idea of uh, the TV licence changing for uh, under-75s has been postponed. This is on the same day that the Prime Minister is, you say, decisive. doesn't look very decisive. Uh, well, uh, I think he is. And like all prime ministers, he's been making lots and lots of decisions all the time, particularly uh, at a very difficult time with the pandemic. That is an evolving, moving situation where sometimes, yes, you have to change tack and, ad and adapt your approach to deal with an emerging situation. But on um, uh, you know all of the other uh, key areas, I mean, let's uh, uh, take leaving the EU. Uh, he was clear that we would leave, that we would leave at the end of this year, clear that we would not extend the transition period, and we didn't. Clear that we would, uh, we clear would, clear be that we would leave with or without October. an agreement, and we will. George Eustace, good to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the programme. Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Conservative MP for Camborne and Red Ruth. 0345 6060 973 is my number. To come to your calls in a moment, we'll speak to Labour in just a tick too. Swarbrick on Sunday, 1048. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, LBC. Gito Harry, who was communications director to Boris Johnson during Mr Johnson's time as mayor of London. It is a sub-talented team. Is that a fair description in your book? He has been over-reliant on Dom Cummings. Two things have happened. One is Brexit is nearly there. Two, Joe Biden has been elected in the States and reminded us that Trump is not the new normal. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, weekday mornings from 7, LBC.
This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. The good news this dreary Sunday morning is that the vaccine is coming. The bad news is the anti-vaxxers are coming with it. We'll speak to a professor after the news at 11 who suggests that the coronavirus vaccine should be made compulsory when it comes online. And right now online, Labour is calling for emergency legislation to stamp out uh, dangerous anti-vax content. Let's speak to Joe Stevens, Shadow Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, Labour MP for Cardiff Central. Thank you for coming on the programme again, uh, Joe Stevens. Tell us what it is that Labour's asking for here and asking of the social media companies in particular. Morning to you. Good morning, Tom. So what we're calling for is the government to bring forward urgent legislation that would require social media companies, text platforms, to have proper systems in place to prevent the publication on their platforms of dangerous anti-vaccination content, dangerous and harmful content. Um, to prevent it going on their platforms in the first place, but if it actually gets on there, to have systems in place to identify it and to remove it at speed. And we say that, you know, tech, we have to work with tech platforms to be part of the solution on this. They have the technical mm-hmm. expertise to remove content. Um, they already do it in the case of illegal content, and so they should be doing it around harmful and dangerous disinformation on anti-vaccination. Who defines harmful and dangerous or what views are harmful and dangerous when it comes to something like a vaccine? Well, you have um, fact checkers in place and you have, you know, anything to do with vaccination or medical products is peer reviewed. You know, we have very stringent regulation in Britain around pharmaceuticals and vaccinations Mm -hmm. anyway. So this is designed because we know, and there's plenty of evidence of it, that there are targeted campaigns of disinformation, which are campaigns at scale. And, you know, social media platforms have the capacity to spread information to billions of people. So we're now talking about disinformation, specific campaigns of disinformation that say what about the virus, uh, about the vaccine, that it's going to make you ill or something? Yeah, so what we're talking about is, you know, harmful disinformation, and that is online at the moment. If you Google anti-vaccination into a search engine, you know, any search engine, what will come up will be lists and lists and lists of groups, some of which have tens of thousands of members, and the content on those, you know, this the the whole conspiracy theory stuff about having microchips embedded in you and all of that, you know, so there is lots of this stuff online already, and and we know... you want the government to legislate against that? We want the government to legislate to put a duty on the social media platforms to prevent harmful and dangerous content being on their platforms and being spread. Now, you know, they can do this. They already remove content. They already act um, like hybrid. They remove content that's illegal. Terms, You're right. They remove, they remove content, content that, that, is, that breaks the yeah. law. But yeah. this doesn't break the law. It might it might break you know any conventional wisdom or science based uh, understanding of what a vaccine does. There's no suggestion of microchips or anything like that. But do we not get into difficulties with this issue about freedom of speech here? If we're now asking, we're we're legislating for the social networks, the media companies, to decide for themselves what dangerous and harmful means. Well, social media networks have no regulation in place. Broadcast media does. You know, that has um, statutory regulation in place and an independent regulator provided by legislation. Print media has regulation in place. Social media has no regulation at all. And, you know, this is not about limiting free speech. This is about huge companies giving the biggest platform in history Mm to spread harmful disinformation. And we know what this disinformation does because, you know, if you look at what the Royal Society for Public Health have said, they have warned for a long time that social media was propagating anti-vaccination messages. And last year, Britain lost its measles-free status. So there Mm. is genuine and real harm caused to people as a consequence of what social media platforms are allowing to happen on their products. And if it is the case, just finally on this, if it is the case that the people's views towards a vaccine are changed by the disinformation campaigns, that means that they're not going to take the vaccine. Do you think there's at some point down the line a point where Labour say, actually, the vaccine should be made compulsory, um, given the dangers of coronavirus spreading once again and forever around the country? 
we we don't we don't advocate compulsory vaccinations. So what we need in conjunction with this legislation, which you know the government accept because they have said they will bring forward online harms legislation, they just delayed mm -hmm. and not done anything about it. So the government accept our argument, um, but at the same time, what we do need is a very comprehensive, clear, reassuring public information campaign from government ahead of the vaccine mm. rollout, not at the same time as the Secretary of State has said that, you know, will happen, ahead of the rollout to protect people, to reassure people who have got genuine concerns and have those concerns answered. So this legislation, together with a proper public information campaign that encourages as many people as possible to take up okay. the vaccine, because, you know, the more people that take it up, the better the collective outcome and, you know, the more lives will be saved. Always good to talk to you. Joe Stevens. thank you. Shadow Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, Labour MP for Cardiff Central. Let's squeeze in Nigel before the news at 11. Hi, Nigel. Hi. Yeah, just a couple of points. One, a couple of general points. There's ample time for Boris Johnson to recover. I believe there's four years before the next general election. As far as the bad headlines are concerned, they'll be long forgotten by then. Now, as far as Dominic, what he needs to do is concentrate on the areas of importance to the electorate. Namely, he's got to deal with the pandemic and he's got to plan mm. properly in economic terms in order that we don't have huge surges in inflation and unemployment whilst we're repaying the debt that we've managed to mount up as a result Completely. of the pandemic. And it's interesting, Nigel, that you say that the these headlines will be forgotten that he can reassert a grip. Uh, we'll look at that a bit later. Listen, thank you for your call. Apologies it was so brief. We're coming up to the news at 11 o'clock, after which we'll talk more about the vaccine. Good news that it's on the way. Concern about the anti-vaxxers that are starting up again. Do you think the vaccine should be made compulsory? We'll speak to a professor who says yes. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 11 o'clock. Senior Tories say the recent departure of two close aides from Downing Street is the ideal opportunity for Boris Johnson to reset his relationship with his team and his party. Chief aide Dominic Cummings and Communications Director Lee Kane both left this week amid reports of an internal power struggle at number 10. Speaking to Swarbrick on Sunday, former Cabinet Minister David Davis says now is the time to bring back some of the old guard. Bluntly, you've got the A team on the back benches. You know, you've got the, the Jeremy Hunts, who was uh, you know who was the last uh, the last man standing other than Boris in the leadership campaign. You've got Greg Clark. You've got Damien Green, Liam Fox, proven cabinet ministers who could have added a bit of weight to the cabinet in the last uh, in the last nine months or so. Ireland's foreign minister says a post-Brexit trade deal between the United Kingdom and the EU is very difficult to achieve, but still doable. London and Brussels are trying to work out an agreement for when the current transition period finishes on December 31st. Simon Coveney says the two sides are very far apart on terms of fishing. The Environment Secretary, George Eustace, has told LBC it's down to the EU to move their position. Our request, really, our ask is for... Uh, something that's got precedence in fisheries, there's precedence in terms of how these things should work uh, with Norway uh, and on uh, things like state aid and level playing field provisions. There are precedents in things like the EU-Canada agreement. Ministers insist they have secured a major commitment from Facebook, Twitter and Google to tackle anti-vaccination fake news. Labour is calling for new laws to clamp down on the issue. It wants legislation that would include financial and criminal penalties for companies that don't act against the content. At least 20 people have been arrested and two police officers injured after thousands of Donald Trump supporters marched through Washington, D.C. The group was showing their support for the U.S. president and his continued claims of vote rigging and election fraud. And the entertainer Des O'Connor has died at the age of 88, days after a fall at his home. His agent has confirmed he died in hospital last night. The star was best known for his chat shows, but also enjoyed a successful music career, selling 16 million albums. The weather, blustery showers and rain moving northeast across the country. Some persistent rain from Northern Ireland and southeast England. The winds easing in Scotland, but staying windy elsewhere, particularly for the south. A high of 14 Celsius. From Global's newsroom, I'm Holly Harris.
LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good morning to you. Just gone 11 o'clock. You are listening to and watching Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC. Hope we find you very well this Sunday morning. Tom Swarbrick here until one. We'll talk more about Cummings, Kane and the goings on in number 10 after the news at 12 a bit later. It's the story that is right across all the front pages, uh, the various machinations of the various personalities involved. What does it actually mean, though, for you know, voters, for people who are not really that interested in the personalities behind the door in Downing Street. How does Downing Street's uh, workings and runnings actually affect the decisions that are being made in the country? I put it to George Eustace that the Prime Minister has been, or people around him or whomever, the government has been pretty indecisive of late. U-turns have happened an awful lot. Even again on the front pages, there are stories about decisions that are being delayed or uh, looked at again uh, in order to get it right. Um, and we'll come back to that issue of whether Boris Johnson can be the man to reset the government right now or whether it needs something else. We'll talk about that after 12. But as you know, this week has seen some good news, finally, <laughs> that the vaccine is on the way. At least one is on the way. The papers speculate that there is another that is about to be made ready, that we could start to see two rolled out at the same time. That would, of course, be fantastic. But there are questions, too, about how you persuade those who are uh, distrusting of a vaccine, that it's the right thing to do for them and for people around them to take it without making it compulsory. And indeed, there have been arguments, and I, I wrote about it for lbc.co.uk this week, that MPs have already heard arguments from professors and doctors suggesting that one, the government already has the legal power to make vaccines compulsory, and two, that ethically, they should. 0345 6060 what do you make of the suggestion to MPs that the government could, and perhaps even should, make a vaccine compulsory? Uh, we'll talk in, to, in a moment to Professor David Salisbury, former Director of Immunisation at the Department of Health. First, I'm joined by Professor Julian Savalescu. He's the Uhiro Chair in Practical Ethics, Director of the Oxford Uhiro Centre for Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford. Thank you very much for coming on the programme this morning, Professor. Um, you likened the, the vaccine to the wearing of a seatbelt. Can you explain how? Yeah, um, seatbelts uh, have been made mandatory. They weren't mandatory before. Um, and the reason for that is they reduce the risk of death by 50%. And they also re reduce the risk of injury to other occupants. And they also reduce pressure on limited health resources. Um, now, people initially oppose mandatory seatbelt laws, but, but now they're accepted. And, and sometimes seatbelts even kill the occupant. There are seatbelt related injuries. But when the probability of you know, preventing harm is vastly greater than the probability of, of doing harm, um, mandatory measures can be justified. Are there any instances where mandatory vaccines are, are given to certain people at certain times to protect them arguably from themselves or from other things? Does it exist currently in any form? Yeah, it exists in different um, parts of the world. The United States has mandatory programs of, of vaccination in many states and you can't enter your child into school unless the child's been vaccinated. In Australia, my original home 20 years ago, they have a no jab, no pay um, policy that if you don't get your child vaccinated, you don't receive childcare benefits or you don't receive government sponsored wow. childcare. Um, in Italy, they recently introduced fines um, after outbreaks of measles for not vaccinating children, and that's led to an increase in uptake in, in vaccines. Now, these are, these are relatively small costs. Um, there are no countries or no Western countries that I know of that forcibly vaccinate people. They're usually associated either with fines um, or, or disincentives um, that, that try to move behaviour yeah. towards vaccination. Some of the um, professors in your department, actually, uh, who, who gave this evidence to a select committee of MPs back in the summer uh, about the possibility of making a vaccine compulsory, suggested that the effect of not having the vaccine, as you say, it's still ultimately a choice. There's no forcible uh, way of forcing the vaccine on people. That If you chose not to, you would have to stay in lockdown measures as a result of not having this, this vaccine. Do you see that as a, as a kind of payoff for not having the vaccine, that people would be asked, OK, well, if you don't want to take it, you have to stay in lockdown. You have to comply with these measures. Well, you've got to take the big picture on this. Um, you know, having a, a, a carrying a disease like COVID may not affect you, 
but it may mean that you kill somebody else. So it's essentially like having a gun that can go off at any time um, and or, you know, a, a bottle of toxic bleach that can, can spill into... But is it with know, a 99% survival rate for most people? Is it as dangerous as that? So that's exactly right. It, the probability is much lower. So, you know, I think you have to balance the probability and the gravity of the threat. Um, I don't know whether prolonged lockdowns would be justified, but um, it's it's certainly possible that you we're all already in a one month lockdown. Um, it may be that a, a period of lockdown for people who who aren't vaccinated would be a reasonable compromise. Um, uh, it depends on how effective the vaccine is, what mm. risks it poses to people. If the vaccine is completely, well, almost completely safe, then you'd be more inclined to require people to take it. If there are residual uncertainties, I think the case for imposing heavy penalties is much weaker. Um, I, I can answer this myself, but I'd be interested in your answer as to why it is you think, as I'm getting the response now as you're speaking, Professor, people are massively uh, against the idea of making this compulsory, making this vaccine compulsory. Why, why do you think that is? As you present an analogy with a seatbelt, which sounds you know, straightforward enough, why do you think it is people are so against this? And what can you do to persuade them, do you think? Well, I, I think the reality is that, that first of all, people have realised that if you're under 50, um, the risks are very small. If you're under 30, they're the same as dying in a car accident each year. So they're saying, why should I take a vaccine to protect people over the age of 65 um, and expose myself to risks? And they're concerned about the risks. This has been an unprecedented effort. It took decades to develop a treatment for HIV and in one year, um, we've managed to develop a vaccine for a coronavirus, which we've never had a vaccine for, using novel methods. Um, now, that's going to be tested on 20,000 people, and, and I believe the vaccine will be safe enough. But people are concerned about the rapidity and also their own personal risk. So I think the way to deal with that is to be honest about the limitations uh, of the research, what you've found and what you haven't found, and let people make their own decisions. For what it's worth, I, I'm in favour of some mandatory vaccinations. I'm not sure whether COVID satisfies the criteria for, for being made mandatory, and that's why I've argued in favour for, mm. for considering payment. Good to talk to you. Professor, thank you very much indeed for your time. Professor Julian Savalescu, the Yehiro Chair in Practical Ethics, the Director of the Oxford Yehiro Centre for Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford. Uh, listening to that is Professor David Salisbury, former Director of Immunisation at the Department of Health, Associate Fellow of Chatham House's Global Health Programme. Um, do you think people are going to need to be incentivised, Professor, to take this vaccine once it comes online? Good morning. Well, I think the incentive should be to protect yourself and to protect other people. Um, I'm not in favour of compulsory vaccination. I think there are quite a few good reasons uh, for that position. Um, and it's clear that there are many countries, including this country, that do just as well without compulsion as some countries do with compulsion. In the United States, one of the consequences of making the school entry laws tougher was it pushed more parents to, uh, to educate their children at home and therefore uh, avoid the, the mm. regulation. So I'm not persuaded that we need compulsion. Um, and certainly in this instance of, of COVID vaccination, um, I, I wouldn't be arguing for it at all. To me, a far bigger issue is the practicality of having enough vaccine quick enough to vaccinate yes. enough people who want to be vaccinated. Well, let me ask you about whether you're aware of or working has been done and made public about the threshold that needs to be met of people having the vaccine in order to be effective in the population. Is there a, you know, a sort of magic number that says, right, as long as 70% of people actually take the vaccine, then we, get, we can be OK? Well, that's difficult because it depends on a number of variables. It depends on the efficacy of the vaccine. And we know yeah. from this very first one that's of the order of 90%, which is a fantastic result. It depends on the uptake of the vaccine, obviously, and it depends on the background amount of immunity that exists in the population at that time. And I think people are talking about, with an efficacy of 90%, an uptake of around 60% uh, being 
the sort of number mm -hmm. uh, that you would want to get population immunity. Mm -hmm. But there are so many variables. It depends on how long the vaccine-induced immunity will work. So just, you know, grabbing a number isn't really yeah. going to give us the answer. Okay. It's doing well, it. So I wonder then um, whether actually there is a strong argument to say, well, if we don't know how effective it's going to be, if we don't know at what point it's going to start to spread out into the wider population to make everybody a little bit safer, is there not an argument to say, well, for those who are most at risk, actually we are requiring you to take the vaccine in order to come out of lockdown. For the people uh, for whom coronavirus po poses the most risk, let's put on that, that seatbelt, as it were. Well, if we look at the people who are most at risk, it's very much skewed towards age. And if we look at the experience in this country for age-based vaccination, we already do pretty much the best in the world. We have uptake for seasonal flu vaccine of around 75%. Now, could we get higher with making it compulsory? Um, I would be surprised if we made much of a marginal impact on that uh, already existing very good uptake that we have in this country. Mm -hmm. Where I think we're going to have much more difficulty is with the people who are less than 65 years of age who've got medical risk factors because they're not as good at coming for seasonal flu vaccination. And again, moving out into the healthy uh, population who, as you've already heard, are personally at very, very low risk. And if they're at very low risk, what will their take be on some form of, of mm. compulsion? I mean, if they're going to be fined, they might just say, well, let's pay the fine. So I, I, I think that we need to persuade people to want to be vaccinated for their own benefit and for the benefit of others. Good to talk to you, Professor. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Professor David Salisbury, former Director of Immunisation at the Department of Health, Associate Fellow of Chatham House's Global Health Programme. Do you want to have the vaccine? If you don't want to have the vaccine, do you think anyone could not force you? I'm going to hold you down and stick a needle in you. But if there is a drive to mean that those who are most at risk are presented with greater incentives to take the vaccine, whether it's a financial payment or whether it's a disincentive not to, i.e. the suggestion could be made that if you don't take it, I'm afraid you're going to have to stay under lockdown conditions. 0345 973 If you are implacably opposed to compulsory vaccination, why? And if you don't want to take it, because it's going to hopefully come available around Christmas time, why don't you want to take it? 0345 6060 973. We'll come on to your calls in a few moments. We'll talk too about how the vaccine is going to be developed. As I mentioned in the papers today, the suggestion potentially that we could have another one shortly. Tom Swarbrick here on LBC. It's 1116. The fight against coronavirus. This or any other vaccine is approved. We will be ready to begin a large scale vaccination program. For the very latest, stay with LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Here's Evelina on 84850 this morning, Tom. No way. I will not be taking this vaccine for at least five years. Are you insane? No one knows what the long-term effects are and COVID is not dangerous for me. So why on earth would I risk it? No way, says Evelina. Hold that thought. We'll speak to a medical director in just a moment. Louise is a new caller in Tottenham this morning. Hiya, Louise. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. You are so, more than welcome. Um, the idea of a vaccine as a seatbelt... Well, look, the point the point of the matter that, that for me is that they haven't really explained properly what efficacy means. They're saying it's effective. And what that, as I understand it, and what they said on the news this morning, is that they, they, the people who take this vaccine will be protected from getting the virus. So if they're protected from getting the virus, what's the problem with me not having it? If I get the virus, I can't infect them if they've cho- chosen to, to be protected. So... It's not making any sense and until they make it make some sense because um, they're going on about herd immunity. But if, if everybody who takes the vaccine that they said is 90 percent effective at protecting you from getting the virus, then, you know, they're protected. What are they worried about? Well, let me die. But if COVID, everybody has I? the attitude, if everybody has the attitude that you have, which is it's all right, someone else will do it. Then, then we won't get anywhere. We won't have any protection whatsoever because no one will be having it. The people it. who want it can have it and the people who don't want it don't have to have it. So if you but don't what if want the to people who COVID. don't want it, what if the people who don't want it, one, are, are particularly vulnerable, I, I realise you might not be, but you know we are all to an extent vulnerable to this my, thing. My mum is 88 years old and she doesn't want it. Why should she have it You're, if she doesn't want it? Well, she might not want it. That's fine. No one's going to force her to have it. But should she bear some consequences for not having the vaccine over and above the risk of coronavirus? For example, you you heard there from the professor about people are free not to wear their seatbelt, but they'll be fine for it. Yeah, but why should my mum... Like, if everybody... If once there is a vaccine, everybody who wants to be protected can be protected. You know, you can't... When you but don't only if wear they a take seatbelt... Yes, I know, but that's their choice. So, But when you don't wear a seatbelt... OK, you can cause injury to the other people if you, you know, who are wearing seatbelts. You're still able to do that. But if you don't take a vaccine, you're not able to pass that, your virus, onto the people who have taken it. So you're not causing Yes, but only if enough injury. people have taken it. And Louise, you have, you, you, I understand the point that you're making perfectly well, and you make it well, but um, if enough people have your attitude, if enough, if enough people don't take it, then what protection do we actually have? We just continue as we've been living for, for many, many years to come. It would, it would render a vaccine useless if no one actually took it. I, I, I don't really call. understand what, what, what you're saying. I think that there is enough people... Well, if no one takes the vaccine... Want... <laughs> if no... no, but it's no, well, never going to be well, known. Loads there? of people want it. Loads of people want it. There's tons of people out there who want it and tons of people that don't. And I don't see well, any problem in that. Do you know? This is why I asked the question. Thank you, Louise. This is why I asked the question about... What is the threshold above which the vaccine becomes useful that enough people have had it so that the people who don't want it don't need to have it? And at the moment, we don't have an answer to that. Louise, thank you. Let's try and get some answers from Ian Gray, Medical Director at Sanofi Pasteur, UK and Ireland. Uh, Thank you very much for coming on the programme this morning, Mr Gray. Um, Just picking up from Louise's call there, um, you, you heard there people saying, actually, they don't want it, they don't want to take it, and it'll be fine because other people will have it that will make them safe. Is that a view that you share? No, most definitely not. I think, from my point of view, a vaccine is the is the only way that you can be to be sure to try to prevent this virus from spreading beyond a controllable means. Vaccines are are in place simply to to uh, to um to prevent a disease from becoming um as we're seeing today a pandemic. Vaccines vaccines are as we know a biological uh, complex um, product that goes through rigorous testing to the point where it is approved by regulatory authorities for its use. And that use is based on quality, efficacy and safety. Uh, I, I won't pretend if I ask you the question about what is in the vaccine to make it safe, I won't pretend to understand the answer because I'm, I'm no scientist, I can barely turn on a Bunsen burner. But how, how safe do you think the vaccine will be given the sped up process that, that it's undergone? The, the the research and development, the development phase for vaccines is is um goes through some the most rigorous testing and processes, in the fact that in order to move from from each of the f- the different steps for vaccine development, you have to reach particular endpoints, and one of those biggest endpoints is around safety. So before a vaccine moves from preclinical 
into the phase one, which is the first phase, phase two, phase three, it has to has to show its safety in not only in animals, but also in humans before it goes on into the bigger phase, mm. phase three trials. So the safety is, is, is of utmost importance. And the only when the risk benefit is acceptable will have actually be approved. I wonder how um, that's going to be communicated to people, people who are distrusting or, or not quite on board with the idea that it is as safe as, as medical professionals would like to suggest. I mean, I, I wonder whether senior politicians, people in the front line, would, would be first to take this thing to show that it is safe. I think the, the, the confidence issue is, is something that we have to be very, very careful of because in the UK, vaccine confidence is not as, say, as, as amplified as, say, is, is in the US. In the UK, mm-hmm. yeah, in the, in the UK, we have um, vaccine confidence is, is um, I would consider it to be, to be uh, in, a, in a place where we, are, we, we don't have that issue yet. But if enough people are voicing this through misinformation, and this, this, this takes voice, we will have an issue. This is where, uh, as you mentioned, Tom, the, the authorities and others need to be very vocal to shut down the, the anti-vaccine movement to, um, that, 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 that puts misinformation. But, right. but is, it, is it an anti-vax movement? that also includes people who will choose not to have this for whatever reason. I mean, you can challenge their suggestions that there's microchips in and all kinds of absolute nonsense. But if people say, well, do you know what? I just, I'm just not going to have it. What should happen to them? In the end of in the, end of the day, it's a public health. Um, we all have a, a social responsibility to protect each other and to try and make each other a live in a, living in, in, in an environment where we are yes. protecting protected so we have a, a social responsibility i feel to be vaccinated to protect your loved ones so we sort of shame them we say to them you're 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 not doing your bit you know pull together lads let's get this vaccine we we sort of morally reduce them more than ever now tom more than ever now we have to come together as a, as, a, as a country and as a community to try and protect each other if if a, if if we if we do this, we have a chance to try and to try and beat this virus with the vaccines that we have that we have, we have are developing. Really good to talk to you. Thank you very much for coming on the program, Ian Gray, medical director at Sanofi, Sanofi Pasteur, UK and Ireland. Thank you very much for coming on the program this morning. Really interesting. Sam is in East Ham. Hi there, Sam. Hi there. Yeah, I think everybody should be vaccinated. To be honest, I think it is for the betterment of. The, I don't know the everyday everyday individual to have this virus eradicated if we could, but given the amount of people that are so against it, I think much like people that don't wear masks, I think they should be put on a um, do not help list if they do get COVID. I think the, the amount of people that say that they don't want to take the vaccination shouldn't we then free do not up? Help. Yeah, as in if they don't want to help. To fight it at the best, I mean, the best possible help there is. If people don't want the vaccination, well, they should be at the bottom of the list when it comes to if they do get it. And I think they should give those vaccines that were given up by those people who are on a bottom higher what priority list, list than what's me. The, what's at the list? You know, the list that was given to us to say over 80s are going to get it first and then the 70s are yeah. going to get it first. And when I found out how low I was, I thought, thank God there are anti vaxxers out there because maybe then that will free up the list for me to be getting priority for it, because I really want the thing. It's been eight months since I've had a social life. It's been eight months since I've been on holiday. It's been eight months since I've had teaching in university. I want my life to go back to normal. So yeah. those of us that are No, I understand the rules, that. I just don't, I'm not seeing what the consequence... You're, you're saying that they dropped to the bottom of the list. Well, they don't care about yeah. the list because they're not going to take it, so they don't mind. They don't give a jot about your list. Well, yeah, but I'm obviously um, the government... So what's really the consequence of not taking it, it for them? So if they, so, the if, so Sam, if you if you make it, hang on a sec, sir. If you make it compulsory, what's the blowback to someone who says, "Well, I'm not taking it, and you're not going to force one uh, a vaccine in me, so I'm I'm just not going to bother turning up at my appointment or whatever." When they what do, happens to them then? When and if they do get ill, then I'm sorry, you don't get priority when you go begging for help from the same institutions. So you that leave people to, to die in the their beginning. homes. Well, if that, but they don't believe in the virus, obviously. So why should they get the help? It should be given to those of us who actually take uh, take care of ourselves and really do believe in science and really do believe in wearing masks and are following the rules. The people that don't care, why are we even wasting breath, no pun intended, helping them who don't actually care or don't actually want to look after the, their next-door neighbour or their, their work colleagues by getting the vaccine? 
you guys can go live on COVID Island and the rest of us who want to be vaccinated and want to get rid of this and have our lives back to normal, we should be protected. Right up, put, put yourself Island. on like a do not resuscitate list. Or yes, you oh, can use Sam, my donor I don't think I, I really don't think the consequence of the consequence of not taking the the vaccine in your land where it is compulsory is then did you just let them die? Uh, Bob's in Wakefield in West Yorkshire. Hi there, Bob. Hi, Tom. Uh, there's no need to be quite so draconian. It's a slippery slope. Uh, is that it's, it's akin to um, no denying treatment to old these people on the NHS or smokers or people with bad mm-hmm. lifestyles. There is a one simple measure to to take to solve this problem and sort out the flat earthers, and that is you get the vaccination, you get a swipe card with a ma- uh, with a, um, a magnetic strip like a credit card to say uh, that you've had the vaccination and you're only allowed to attend public events, football matches, concerts, public transport, travel abroad if you have have got the card. So this is a sort of COVID passport thing that was talked yeah, about before. Yeah, yeah. But now so you would no introduce compulsion. Bob to say, well, I've had the vaccine so I can come in. Yeah, and there's no compulsion then, is there? They want to lead a solitary life and not go abroad, not go to Benidorm. Not well, you are relegating people United. for the choice that they're making. You are making, mm-hmm. a, you are making a decision to say to those people who, for whatever reason, decide not to take the vaccine, that their lives are going to be harder than those who no, do. No, they are. Is that fair? No, they're excluding themselves. They're excluding themselves by their antisocial behaviour. All right. Bob, we're all in this together. Thank you very much indeed for your call. 0345 6060 Loads of you want to get on the radio this morning. Come to more of your calls in just a few moments. Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC. 11.31 is the time. Can't even get my own name out. Here's Holly Harris. A government minister insists number 10 is working well after the departure of Dominic Cummings. George Eustace has told LBC the Prime Minister will remain decisive about key issues including Brexit and the coronavirus pandemic despite the loss of his key advisor. The Irish government says there will be no post-Brexit trade deal between the UK and the EU if Westminster passes legislation that breaks international law. Ministers in London are adamant the internal markets bill is needed to ensure trade can continue between different parts of the UK. Labour's calling for new laws to tackle conspiracy theories about coronavirus vaccines. It wants penalties for social media platforms which allow misinformation to spread. The weather, blustery showers and rain moving northeast across the country this afternoon. The winds easing in Scotland but staying windy elsewhere, particularly in the south. A high of 14 Celsius. The fight against coronavirus. This or any other vaccine is approved. We will be ready to begin a large-scale vaccination programme. For the very latest, stay with LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Speaking to someone at the start of just after 11 o'clock from the Uhiro Medical Ethics Centre at the University of Oxford, and I mentioned to our guest that some of his colleagues had written to MPs already in the last few months outlining their position that it could be a case could be made. They weren't arguing that the government should do this, by the way, but they were saying that there is an ethical case to be made for making the vaccination compulsory. And one of the bits of evidence that they submitted to MPs I thought was really interesting in that they argue that the Coronavirus Act 2020, this is the thing that was voted through by MPs in, in just four days back in March, uh, they say, quote, that the Coronavirus Act does not explicitly prohibit the imposition of compulsory medical treatment or vaccination and as our, our guest did earlier, they point to other countries and other countries in Europe that have mandatory vaccination policies like Italy, like Austria. Uh, and interestingly, in response to, to that, the Department of Health have said, in the UK, we do not currently have mandatory vaccination, but operate a system of informed consent. The word currently rather wor worried me there. You can read that lbc.co.uk. Let's come to your calls. Here's Carol, new caller, St Albans. Hi, Carol. Hi. How are you? I'm extremely well. Tell me about whether or not you think there is a case to make I this think mandatory. Absolutely, no, I, think they, I do not think that it should be mandatory. I think that the difference with all other vaccinations is that a huge number of people die. And as you've seen with COVID, there are different rates of death depending on your age range and vulnerability. So I think it's brilliant that we've got a, var a vaccination for those people. My, my 82 and 88 year old parents, they'll take it. People who are vulnerable should take it. But why should my 16 year old and my um, 20 year old take it when you don't know the long term uh, impact? And for the children, they're not going to, you know, there's a very, very low risk of that. Most of them are asymptomatic. There's a very low risk yes. of them getting very we're ill not, from it. We're not, with respect, we're not just talking about deaths, are we? That, because even though a lot of people have, you know, over 50,000 people have now died, um, we are living like this because of the possibility of further transmission, transmission that would exceed the capacity within the health service. So even if, if people, people don't die, hang on a sec, vulnerable. Carol, if people, uh, if people don't die, it still means that more people could end up in hospital than we can cope with, which leads the health service to collapse. That's but why we're, we're living like this, right? if the people who would go into the hospital are vaccinated, if the people who are vulnerable are vaccinated, then but the other people you. who choose not to, be be me. not to be vaccinated, they're not going to give it to those who are vaccinated. No, but they can still spread it around amongst themselves. So if there's a large chunk of the population who aren't vaccinated, then they can still spread it around. It can mutate, it can change. They are not protected but, in any greater way than the people, people who take who the vaccine. are unlikely to go into hospital. So if they choose not to take to. it... If they're those, unlikely yes, to, but, but, but the they're still they're unlikely to now. And we look at how we're living. Look at what damage th is being done to the economy. But I don't think we will live like that. See people go and play golf. But I, just I don't play think golf, we will Carol. live like that. That's my point. I think that if the vaccine comes in, I'd probably take it. I think if the vaccine came in and those who want to be protected are take take it, then those who don't need to be protected, they won't have to cause the society yeah. to live the way we're living now. It just means well, yeah. that they will not be transmitting the disease to those people who would end up in hospital. And then, and then the discussion moves on to, well, what happens to those vulnerable people who don't want to take it? But Carol, listen, great call. Thank you for it. Let's move on to Neil, I think. New caller. Apparently you're in the Ukraine, Neil. Welcome to the programme. I'm indeed. Good morning. Uh, yeah, no, I think there's a point that people uh, are missing or haven't uh, mentioned about. There's a group of people who are immunocompromised and can, uh, cannot take a vaccine or it won't work for them. And even the people that take the vaccine, there's like 94% well, of effective vaccine. There's still 6-7% of the people which it hasn't worked for. So this group, even if they are uh, vulnerable, uh, they can't, or they, uh, uh, if they do, it doesn't work for them. These people are going to be threatened if we don't make the vi vaccine, uh, well, make everybody take it and get the general immunity. And uh, people not taking the virus are also contributing to the fact that it will, might mutate and maybe become resistant to the, uh, to the vaccine we have now and cause further risk for the future. Why do I need to take a vaccine for an illness where there is a 99.9% .9 of survival rate for some age groups, um, and which it's still, even, uh, even if it's not survival, even if it's hospitalisation, is still incredibly low? Why do I need to vaccinate myself against that? 
Well, because you want to stop it mutating. You want to stop it um, getting into those vulnerable uh, groups where it does become serious. And even mm. if you don't die, there's all this talk of long-term effects and impairments from people who've had COVID. So there's three very good so items to do, do that. So what do you do is, what's the result of, of not following the order to take the vaccine? What, what should happen to people that choose not to? Well, I think, uh, I read a, an article from Lufthansa this morning that they're going to uh, operate, or they're convinced operating airlines will move to a sort of COVID-free way of operating where they say you can only get on an aircraft if you've been vaccinated or have a have wow. a, a, a test in the last cu- uh, last couple of days. And I think that's more driven by the international community and the very... Well, ta- uh, no, but hang on a sec, hang on. There's a massive, there's a world of difference between saying you can't come on the plane if you haven't been vaccinated and if you've had a test. I think if you've had a test, that's understandable, well, no, but... Uh, but to but, but, right. but to say to people you cannot live your life as you once did based on on not having a vaccine for a particular illness that is a new that is a new way of living that this this country and this part of the world certainly would enter into right well i mean i've lived in mainland europe uh, in areas where it is uh, it is compulsory and i've never really been bothered about taking vaccines because i don't really see i don't really see the downside of doing it um yes there are some side effects but they're generally uh, in any of the vaccines that I've looked into have been side effects that are less likely to uh, mm-hmm. uh, occur than the uh, illness itself, uh, than uh, if you get the illness itself, or less likely than you getting the illness itself. So, right. um, what's the downside? Neil, good to talk to you. Live from the Ukraine. Uh, text here on 84850, just don't let people on airplanes until they've had a vaccine certificate. See how long the anti-vaxxers last without a holiday abroad. It's likely foreign countries may ask a, ask for a certificate before they let you in. It's a very good point, that, actually, about the rollout of the vaccine. And I think you're starting to see some of that take place in the calls that Boris Johnson is having with other world leaders. I noted that he spoke to the South Korean uh, premier a, a, a couple of days ago about the global uh, programme to roll out the vaccine, because everywhere, I think, has almost got to be on the same... Uh, level of understanding, the same plane of understanding about about what happens after a vaccine is taken, because otherwise you will end up with situations like that. Well, one country will say, well, you can't come in if you haven't had the vaccine. One country will say, well, you can't come in if you, if you haven't had the vaccine after this point, and it will all become incredibly difficult. Uh, Vishan is in Greys. Hi, Vishan. Hi there. Thank you for taking my call. You're welcome, sir. I, I think the question for me is, uh, are you re- your medical professional that you had on just a a couple of calls ago stated that they base it around quality efficacy and safety my question is how are they managing to take the normal approval process which is many many years if not decades for vaccinations and drug trials and compacting that into what we may consider within a year to two years i would be happy to take the vaccine i'm fairly healthy but would i trust the vaccine would be okay for my mother who has multiple underlying conditions or or my wife who's type 1 diabetic, Uh, if you've worked in any kind of business, you know that the moment you start expediting processes, things start to fall apart along along those, uh, within those types of businesses and processes. How are they avoiding all of that for the medical Mm. industry, which has a process which takes many years anyway? Listen, I think it's a a perfectly fair question, actually. Um, And a huge amount of very careful work is going to have to go into communicating the safety and the process behind making this vaccine to allay some of the fears that Vishan, you and and many others have. Um, If the workings aren't shown, then things become very difficult and it's easier for people to make the case against taking the vaccine, isn't it? Well, then half the problem is we're already talking about misinformation and the spread of misinformation, which I agree is bad, but we've had no other a point of reference. I can't go to a .gov website. I can't go to any of these vaccination websites. And I've tried looking this stuff up. I can't find information on what's being done, how it's being done, if the testing that they're going to carry out is actually taking into account various people mm. with, uh, with various underlying conditions and to what well, listen, degree. Vishan, this is exactly the kind of work that, that certainly the central government, number 10, ought to be doing now around the communicating of this vaccine, but also some of the medical groups too. Thank you for your call. It reminds me, I was listening to this brilliant podcast the other day, um, about how in wartime, pr- wartime provides the incentive for huge change on on a very, very short timescale. So exactly as Vishan outlined for, for the vaccine, these things took 
years. They took ages. They took a long time. The the situation that we're in demands that it happens a lot quicker. And maybe it's the case that one of the things that lasts uh, f- throughout this pandemic and after is the speed with which things are, are got done, the, the effectiveness of processes like coming up with a vaccine. The expectation is it's now just much faster, much quicker, much more effective than the years it was taking previously. And that can be applied to a whole load of areas. You know, around the Second World War, for example, you moved from you know, basically planes, terrible planes, bad planes, <laughs> sound like Trump now, bad planes, to, to jet fighters within a couple of years. No one thought that was possible before. It demanded, the circumstances demanded speed. 0345 973 Come to more of your calls in a few moments. Tom Swarbrick here, 1146. Eddie Mayer on LBC. Boris Johnson said when the data changes, we must change course. The truth is, though, the data changed on September the 21st when Sage said the country faced a very large epidemic with catastrophic consequences unless immediate action was taken with a two-week circuit breaker. Well, there was, there was clearly a range of views within Sage. Town. Sage's advice Sage was completely just, clear. There is no perfect time for these things. You have to always balance. No, but do you concede the that if these measures had been introduced on the 21st, then thousands of people might not be dead? Eddie Mayer, Monday to Friday from 4pm, LBC.
This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. 11.51 is the time. Matthew's been in touch on Twitter, at Tom Swarbrick one He says, we need better communication to understand the pros and cons. More information needs to be publicised with the information on the vaccine to enable people to decide. Persuade the population. Fear leads to more fake news and rise in conspiracy theories. We'll talk about the disinformation around vaccines after the news at 12. Monifa is in Fulham. Hi, Monifa. Hi. Hi. Yeah, um, I just, I'm not an anti-vaxxer or anything like that. I mean, I'm vulnerable myself and I've got conditions the list of my arm. But just with the way the government treats disabled people and vulnerable people in general and how our, our healthcare in general is a shambles. So my whole thing is that, say, for example, we do take the vaccine and something goes wrong, the government could just about admit that they failed us vulnerable people in general, let alone if something big was to go on. I just can't imagine them saying, yeah, hi, we've done this to you and we can rectify it. And they've just not been clear cut to us about how it would actually affect us. And even with all the medications and stuff we take, we don't even know how it would interact with stuff on a daily basis. So you haven't got enough information right now, Manifa, to make the decision about the safety of, of any vaccine with the medication that you're taking for other conditions? Yeah, that, and especially just the way that they've treated disabled people in general it's just not they've not given us clarity just overall so i just can't imagine especially other people with my with conditions like mine i just can't imagine them feeling you know secure enough to want to take anything do you i was going to ask do you think there is a uh, information that could be given to you that would persuade you that it is safe to do and that would lead you to the conclusion that you ought to do it information that literally said you know we are sure that this will not hamper your conditions that you have already that are already making it that have caused you to have to shield for this amount of time and there's information that literally says if you take this and you know you will be fine you won't end up going out and then catching covid even worse then fair enough but so far they've never been able to provide information like that even on previous vaccines that they've done true but if but if Monifa as strikes me just listening to some of our experts this morning talk about it seems to be the case that they can't say that it isn't 100% risk free nothing is 100% risk free but that the risks are incredibly low infinitesimally small would that be persuasive enough for you i don't it depends on how they back that up it depends on how they mm. back that up because just their whole attitude in general in general and even like some of the disabled community might agree the way that they have responded to us when we've had concerns about previous drugs in general has always been you know if something goes wrong they're hardly likely to admit liability okay. so that is like so my you want some responsibility concern. you want some ownership of it yeah you want yeah, some ownership and, like, of it ownership of it instead of just hiding behind several different parties and different people different people right. Manifa that's really interesting good perspective thank you very much for your call here's Andrea another new caller to the program in Camberwell hi there Andrea hello hi um so my concerns are as the previous caller I am not an anti-vaxxer I have in the past had vaccines myself however mm -hmm. with regards to this one I feel that you know, it's been sped up so quickly that we have no idea about the potential long-term implications of the vaccination. Also, um, you know, yes, they've done their clinical trials, but you cannot generalise the responses of those um, volunteers to the rest of the population. You know, everybody biologically is slightly different to somebody else, and we know that medications work differently for you, large groups of people. You know, um, me and myself, I cannot take the um, but any chemical birth control, hormonal birth control, because it just mm -hmm. doesn't work for me. I just cannot tolerate it. Yeah. So as much as they have, th those are my two main concerns. Is the and are you, Andrea, someone who is... Are you uh -huh. someone who is um, 
more at risk of COVID-19 and the effects of COVID-19 well, than others? Uh, well, you, I, am, you've been I, am, I am from the black and um, I, I'm a black woman. I'm a black female. Mm. However, I do not feel that I am more at risk of Right. Um, contract, because I guess it, there's a calculation it. for people mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. that that worries that the risks right now, and I'm not saying that this is true, and hopefully someone will will uh, later down the line be able to persuade, but that the risks of taking the the vaccine actually outweigh the risk to you, Andrea, of of getting coronavirus. The risk of taking the vaccine. Yeah, that there's more the risk, risk in taking the vaccine than there is okay. in just carrying on like you are at the moment. So, for I wonder me if that's or is that something you feel? No, I don't. For me personally, and I'm not dis discounting the evidence that has been done about black and um, BAME, the BAME community and yeah. their risk. But for me personally, I take very good care of my health. I am not arm um, at risk of diabetes i know what my vitamin d levels are because i have been um taking vitamin d for the past five years because i'm aware of the lack of um mm. sun on black skins and how it affects mm. us um you know andrea you know, i should have asked you've reminded mm -hmm. me um and thank mm -hmm. you for doing so i should have asked david davis who i had on the program a little earlier uh he is someone that has been lobbying very hard to get vitamin d sent out to people who might be um vitamin D deficient because of the links between good vitamin D and a good um, immune system to fight off things like coronavirus. And indeed, I note the Scottish government did it a few weeks ago, sent out four weeks worth of free vitamin D to people who might be immunosuppressed to try and help them along with it. Uh, that vitamin D link is still being explored. Good call. Thank you. Let's get to Nicholas, who's another new caller to the programme in Wandsworth. Hi there, Nicholas. Hello, Tom. First time caller. Very welcome I to the programme. What made you pick up the phone, sir? Well, I feel very strongly about this issue. Um, there's things I read, and uh, they've talked about informed decisions, and I read about uh, a YouGov um, consultation paper which closed on the 19th of September. Three things very much concerned me. One was that unlike all previous vaccinations, this vaccine will not be licensed. It may be tested, but it won't be licensed. The second problem is that they said that the pharmaceutical companies that are um, that are going to distribute this uh, uh, vaccine are going to be given immunity from prosecution, which means if I die from side effects, my wife or family cannot sue the pharmaceutical companies. So I, I where is this uh, written, Nicholas? It's when a YouGov. It was a, a, a consultation report along with three other points, which I mean, one is that they were going to um, try and bring it in in line, line with the flu vaccine, so they could bring it on the slides and think having a flu jab. Well, and if, two with respect, and if this is if with... this is YouGov, if this is YouGov, it strikes me that it feels more like a YouGov do surveys, don't they? I don't know that they do reports into what's written in legislation about coronavirus. We'll look into it. I think Nicholas, you have described what a lot of people have described so far this morning that they need more information. We'll get some more information about the disinformation on the virus in a few moments' time. If you've taken part in one of the trials, by the way, love to hear from you this morning. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at midday. A government minister has been defending the work of Number 10 over criticism about the handling of the departure of Dominic Cummings. Boris Johnson's special adviser left on Friday following claims of a bitter power struggle. But the Environment Secretary, George Eustace, has told Swarbrick on Sunday Mr Johnson remains decisive on key issues. Like all Prime Ministers, he's been making lots and lots of decisions all the time, particularly... Uh, at a very difficult time with the pandemic. That is an evolving, moving situation where sometimes, yes, you have to change tack and, ad and adapt your approach to deal with an emerging situation. With more talks scheduled to take place this week, the Irish government says there will be no post-Brexit trade deal between the UK and the EU if Westminster passes legislation that breaks international law. Ministers in London are adamant the Internal Markets Bill is needed to ensure trade can continue between different parts of the UK.
The government insists letting coronavirus vaccine disinformation spread unchecked could cost British lives and it takes the issue extremely seriously. Labour is calling for such content to be stamped out on social media. It's hoped that a vaccine rollout will begin before the end of the year and will go first to care home residents and workers. But the former director of immunisation at the health department, Professor David Salisbury, has told LBC there are many unanswered questions. An uptake of around 60% uh, being the sort of number Mm -hmm. uh, that you would want to get population immunity. But there are so many variables. How long the vaccine-induced immunity will work? So grabbing a number isn't really going to give us the answer. It's doing it. A survey has found around two and a half million households in the UK are worried about paying rent this winter. The research by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation estimates 700,000 homes are already in arrears and around half that number are at risk of eviction. And Des O'Connor has died after a fall at his home. He passed away last night, aged 88. The entertainer headed up his own primetime chat shows for more than 45 years and also had a successful music career with four top ten singles. The weather, blustery showers and rain moving northeast across the country this afternoon. The wind easing in Scotland but staying windy elsewhere, particularly in the south. A high of 14 Celsius. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Holly Harris. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Just gone 12. Very good afternoon to you. The programme's sliding on into Sunday afternoon. Hope we find you very well. Tom Swarbrick with you here on LBC. If you want to know the state of British politics on this Sunday afternoon, on the 15th of November 2020, with all that's going on in the world, then you can turn no further than the front page of the Sunday Mirror, which has the headline, Princess Nutnuts. Now, if you don't know to what that's referring, then you've been, well, you've missed it over the last few days. This internal row that has happened in number 10 that has spilled out onto the front pages over the last five days, the infighting that has gone on, the briefing that has led to uh, slurs made about the Prime Minister's fiancée, Dominic Cummings, apparently referring to Carrie Simmons as Princess Nutnuts, uh, has led, it would seem, to both of uh, Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane being turfed out of number 10. We spoke a little earlier to Cabinet Minister George Eustace about the state of the state centre of this government. Um, You'll hear what he had to say a bit later. But I want to carry on talking about the vaccines. Given the good news this week that one is coming on, that the AstraZeneca trial has been a success, this vaccine apparently 90% effective, but the challenge that governments around the world have, and social media companies, not just governments have, of stopping the anti-vaxxer movement, playing on people's fears, and I think as we've been hearing for the last hour, worries about the speed at which this vaccine has been produced. A lot of callers have started um, coming on by saying, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but... And that but is, is, is interesting to me, that of course people would take a vaccine if they believed it to be safe, if they thought it was worth um, uh, doing it in order to protect them from the thing that it's meant to protect them from. At this stage, though, it doesn't feel like a lot of people do believe that the speed has been properly explained to them and that the safety has been properly explained to them. The other part of this, too, is when it comes to social media, stamping out some of the disinformation that we're seeing, Labour calling for emergency legislation to do that, the government saying they're already working with the social media companies to try and get them to agree to best practice. And that is something that is taking a lot of time um, in governments and it's been suggested by former members of GCHQ. uh, There are specific and determined disinformation campaigns, orchestrated disinformation campaigns, to sow the kind of discord that we would normally see around, I don't know, whether it's Western institutions or other uh, other parts of the the governing, um, that lead to a mistrust. We are now seeing those campaigns up and running 
about vaccines. Dr Samantha van der Slot joins us, University Research Lecturer at the Oxford Vaccine Group at the University of Oxford. She is currently researching parental attitudes and decisions on vaccination, particularly in relation to pro-vaccination behaviours and vaccine acceptance. Great to talk to you, uh, Dr van der Slot. Thank you for coming on. Um, my callers have started off this morning by saying they're not anti-vaxxers, but do you understand where that but comes from right now? Yeah, so I suppose with this vaccine, it's it's new and people aren't understanding the process that's going into developing a vaccine, also at a faster speed than would normally happen. So the messaging needs to be really clear that no corners are being cut. So uh, what's happened with um, a lot of the vaccines in development is that they're being manufactured at risk. So um, normally you'd um, pay for doses of the vaccine to be made once you know it definitely works. But what we're seeing with the vaccines being developed for COVID-19 are that they're being they're being made before we know that they work. So um, that's one way of speeding up the process. Also, the the regulatory bodies who um, will be overseeing these vaccines being developed, they're working very quickly. And there's a lot of resources and funding that that make the, this um, process a lot quicker than it would normally be. What does your research say to you about how best to persuade people that vaccines are safe and it's in their interests to seek one out? Yeah, I think we can't dismiss the fears and concerns that people have. Uh, it is a difficult um, subject to convince people on and it does rely on trust. So um, if there's any undermining of people's trust by government and pharmaceutical companies, that mm. can really have a big impact on whether people uptake um, this vaccine and, and any COVID-19 vaccine. So hearing from health professionals and scientists who people tend to trust much more than governments and pharma companies will, will have an effect on uh, people taking up on a COVID-19 vaccine. What is the threat here? I mentioned about these organised disinformation campaigns around the vaccine. What, is, what do you think is the, is the real threat that they pose? Um, so that's that's had a kind of mixed impact because uh, we do see a lot of ne negative messages about vaccines online, but it's not clear that um, people always react to those. And the influence that those campaigns are having on a larger scale um, will probably be related to specific events. So if um, a particular controversy is picked up on and um, is believed more widely. Those are the kind of events that will have more of an effect than just general disinformation about vaccines. Mm. Um, and so in thinking about the next step of trying to show to people that this thing is, is safe and worth um, seeking out, what would you suggest is the most critical thing that scientists, that global leaders, that somebody somewhere <laughs> needs to do to persuade people that it is good? Yeah, so I think also going into those social media spaces and um, filling the void. So uh, if people have questions and concerns about vaccination, uh, we need to see um, governments and also the health authorities having an impact within those social media spaces um, so that they don't have their answers um, from uh, anti-vaccine groups. Mm. When it comes to parental attitudes, um, how, are, how are parents best persuaded to get vaccines for their children. My, my youngest has just had her flu vaccination and my eldest is about to have his and we are perfectly happy to have them have them because we think it's in their interests to do so. How do, how do I get to the point of, of being okay about it, I guess? Yeah, so, I mean, people tend to trust their doctors and also um, friends and family. So um, if you're hearing positive messages from those people, you're more likely to be vaccinating. Um, the media does have an impact. And I think um, the way media reporting has been about vaccination has changed since the, the MMR days. So uh, you don't yeah. tend to see what's called a false balance of um, having someone who's in support of vaccinations and in support of um, the scientific consensus pitted against um, a very strong anti-vaxxer. Uh, that's, that's not the way that um, media tends to represent this debate mm. anymore. So I think it has moved towards um, acknowledging that there's a scientific consensus in support of vaccines um, and try not to portray um, anti-vaxxers on the same level as um, those who uh, talk about the science of vaccines. Uh, and just finally about the, the, the balance between 
asking people, persuading people, and then sort of forcing people, not not physically, but but persuading uh, people through incentives to either to take it or disincentives um, if if they don't take it. Where do you, where's your gut instinct on making vaccines compulsory? Uh, I, I think that can really worry people. So. Um, even those people who are supportive of vaccinations might not like the idea of being compelled to vaccinate. So any of this hinting of making uh, a COVID-19 vaccine compulsory, I think that that provokes a reaction in people. And Mm. you might see a pushback against vaccination uh, in in general, just from those those hints at possible compulsory vaccination. And it's not really, I don't think it's very helpful. I think um, that it doesn't do anything to build the trust between no. governments and um, the public. And do you think just finally that once people have had the vaccine, there should be some way of, of sort of displaying that? I mean, we've heard already about airlines that are saying, well, you need to test before you can come on. You need to have a negative test before you can come on. Do you think there's a chance that we'll get to a point where in order to distinguish those who have been vaccinated from those who haven't, you'll need a card or a passport or I don't know a lanyard <laughs> yeah I mean well we do do that for some vaccines like yellow fever and um, I, I think yeah so um, in in certain countries where there is yellow fever or if you're coming from a country that has yellow fever you will need to show um, that you've had the vaccination uh, so these kind of restrictions are all already in place and where they make sense Um, Mm. With COVID-19, I think the problem will be that um, not everyone will have access to a vaccine to begin with, um, especially across different countries. So this is going to be a question of um, uh, will you will you actually be um, putting in a policy that that works? So that will really need to be considered um, if that um, comes into place. Great to speak to you. Fascinating research, Doctor. Thank you, Samantha Van der Slot, University Research Lecturer at Oxford Vaccine Group at the University of Oxford. Uh, let's turn to Joe, who's a new caller in Sheffield this afternoon. Hi there, Joe. Oh, hello, hello. Good morning. Good afternoon to you. Now, oh, I, sorry, I, good afternoon. I, I, yeah. That's all right. That's all right. It's a, <laughs> it's a fine balance at twelve at yeah. thirty minutes past twelve. Um, I, I suggested before the news that I'd like to hear from people who were taking part in a vaccination trial, and you are. Yes. Yes, I'm a volunteer for the Oxford Oxford vaccine, yeah. So tell us what's happened. Basically, I'm, I'm a nurse by background, and during the, uh, during the first wave, I was redeployed to work in intensive care. And in there, uh, I, I, I saw in the first hand the horror of this, uh, of this pandemic, the, mm. the, the frustration, the anxiety, the, the loneliness that uh, this uh, um, COVID have given, not just relatives, also my colleagues and, and, and all the society. And, and then I, one day I read an article uh, saying that this COVID uh, may come every year, and I say I need to do something. And suddenly, at the end of uh, May, uh, I received an email, not just me, a lot of my colleagues in intensive care, they received an email saying if you wanted to be volunteers for the Oxford, for the phase three, that's where we are now. And, and basically, uh, where they were looking for frontline staff uh, with high risk of getting infected uh, to be volunteers, because on the on the phase three, they're looking for the effectiveness to see uh, if wow. the antibodies that we have the, the vaccine created they are enough to stop the vaccine or not. To do that, the only way is for uh, volunteers to be positive. And this way, Oxford vaccine was very clever because they were guaranteed uh, um, speed and because the, the volunteers were high risk. A lot of my colleagues uh, get infected, and myself. On the 7th of uh, October, I got a positive test, and they did me wow. a lot of a lot of uh, study uh, to see if the vaccine is effective or not. And hopefully, um, we'll be very close to uh, to have a vaccine. You hopefully before Christmas. So you, Joe, you, you were? Did you have to go to Oxford to be? injected with something or take a pill? No, no, no. Uh, no, no. What they've done is that they have regional uh, regional um, 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 teaching hospitals that they can uh, do the trials there. We don't need to go to Oxford. I go to Sheffield to my teaching hospital. But you, you, where... stood, in, you stood in a hospital somewhere and you, yes. someone um, put a needle in you and you weren't sure what was in the needle. 
Well, I don't know because it's, um, at the moment it's a, uh, uh, um, it's a double uh, random. Uh, so some people, mm. 50%, they put placebo, 50%, they put the vaccine. The first dose, they, they divide us in groups. I'm part of the group four, and they do different experiments with the groups. Mine, I have two doses with 90 days uh, between the doses. Another group have uh, two doses with 20, 28 days, and another group have uh, just one dose. And they analyze to see what the response, how many antibodies we produce. And looks like the best option at the moment is, uh, like the Pfeiffer, is two doses mm. uh, with 28 days in between them. That's and Joe, the, the you... one who generates better immunity. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I think, it, uh, I mean, volunteering yourself for something that carries, that does carry risk to yourself is is enormously impressive. I wonder what you would say to my listeners who think that the process that has been undertaken here, because it has happened at such speed, that means that somewhere along the line, a corner would have been cut or something would have been missed that makes it less safe. As someone that's taken part in it, what do you say to them? There's no corners being been, um, cut uh, because um, a lot of the, um, the science, uh, scientists and labs, they know that the virus was coming. Uh, for example, the Oxford vaccine, uh, they, uh, they, have, uh, um, they, they created uh, uh, um, a method that uh, basically with the part of the virus, they just needed to add the coronavirus uh, protein to be able to create the vaccine. But the previous work took three or four, four years. The Dr. Zilber um, team is not just been working since January. Before that, they spent four years mm. to arrive to the point where they can produce the vaccine very quickly. And also, um, one, of the, one of the normally what happened on, with the normal process of a vaccine is that you need to ask a lot of money and it's a lot of waiting and to be approved. But money has been no problem this time. And also, yeah. they, they had allowed uh, to run phase one, phase two, and phase three, sometimes uh, in parallel. Uh, and it might just um, be, Joe, listen, I, again, I, I take my hat off to you for volunteering yourself to do it. That is tremendous. And without volunteers such as yourself, we wouldn't be in a position where we uh, we might have a vaccine very soon. So congratulations to you and thank you. Uh, it might just be that we're actually much better at doing this stuff uh, than had previously been the case because there was no... Um, massive necessity to get it done at speed. It may just be that with all the money that's sloshing around to throw at coronavirus and with the will of scientists across the world to get this done, actually we can we can be much quicker than previously thought in doing these things. Joe, thank you. 0345 6060973. Loads of you want to get on air this morning. Come to more of your thoughts in just a bit. Plus, uh, we'll keep you updated about the ongoing row inside number 10, the fallout that we've seen through the week. Cummings and Kane going. Carrie Simmons left behind the PM, PM's fiance, uh, referred to very disparagingly in some of the papers this morning. We'll bring you what a cabinet minister has had to say about the centre of government and how it's functioning in just a few moments' time. Tom Swarbrick here, 1218. This is LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Text 84850. More on the Downing Street saga in just a moment. First, here's Nick in Hackney on the vaccine. Hi there, Nick. Hello, Tom. Thanks for speaking to me. You um, are more than welcome. I, I, you know, it's understandable that people have got doubts um, about the vaccine given the speed with which it's been produced and the fact that, you know, genuinely we can't have mid and long term safety data, although in the short term the safety data do look good and there's been a lot of international collaboration to bring this together uh, mm. with as much information about safety as quickly as possible but it's it, so it's it's reasonable that people will have doubts, um, but they shouldn't be immediately put in the same bucket uh, as anti-vaxxers. And I think that no, is I doing that is doing people who have balanced views of things a, a real disservice. I mean, you know, just looking at Pfizer, Pfizer had a, a, a lawsuit. They were fined two two point three billion pounds about five years ago for illegal marketing of one of their drugs and. You know, there have been problems with previous vaccines. The swine flu vaccine had, had a 1 in 50,000 rate of narcolepsy, which didn't become apparent until later on. The much-hailed malaria vaccine showed that, it, you know, it had 10 times the rate, yeah. rate of meningitis and, and female. And there, very, very, there are very small risks of taking the flu vaccine. There are very, you know, tiny, tiny fraction of people who take it uh, have some, some side effects over and above, perhaps feeling a little unwell for a bit. Um, so, Nick, I, I, I completely appreciate the point, but where it spills in to anti-vaccination, uh, where that line is, is really difficult to to adjudicate, particularly for the social media companies who are having to deal with millions of people posting lots and lots of nonsense all the time. Yes, and it's important to maintain balance and transparency and transparency and information is actually key here it's uh, so much of it's about trust um some yeah. of that will be achieved by distributing the vaccination campaign campaigns through gps and through uh, you know health services that people can generally trust but the idea of making this thing compulsory i mean we do really well in this country we've got by the age of one, 90% of our children have had a vaccine. Um, mm. And that's just with education. That's, that's is this something to do you work in, Nick? Is this, is this an area yeah. that you work in? I'm a GP, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ah, great. Okay. Um, and and you're, you're you know, a GP the, uh, and, you're, and you're bringing up the, the kind of issues that you worry about when it comes to the other vaccines that we heard you talking about, whether it's, um, you know, the difficulties with some of them. That worries you as a GP, does it? It, it doesn't worry me, but I mean, you know, I'm informed about those things. So I know that when people have doubts about the vaccine, it's really important to find out where those doubts are coming from mm. so that they can be um, allayed with proper information, not just mm. with, you know, to say the vaccine's 100% safe, all vaccines are good. Uh, if you don't have this vaccine, you're stupid and selfish. It, it's really going to create entrenchment um, and the idea of moving towards compulsory vaccination, I think, does that. It takes any kind of balanced judgment out of the situation. People like to feel that they're making an informed decision for themselves. Yes. And certainly, I think if I you're agree. having a medical I, I treatment do agree of any with you. I do. Sorry to cut you off, Nick. But I, I, listen, I do agree with you. I just guess, I, I guess that there is a... Uh, a point at which it's all very well attempting to persuade people to come to the right conclusion, being that of, you know, the, the doctors and the nurses who say this is the right thing to do to take this vaccine. If you don't get enough people there quickly enough, then you've got a real problem about vaccine efficacy. And then we're living in this lockdown form, rolling lockdowns for years and years and years. So maybe then the idea of, of making it compulsory does actually have to come in. But Nick, we'll wait and see. Listen, really interesting perspective. Again, thank you for the call. 0345 6060 973 is my number. 84850 to text. And of course, you can tweet at LBC and I'm at Tom Swarbrick 1. Let's turn to the big story on the front page of many of the newspapers uh, this Sunday. Sunday Mirror, Turmoil in Downing Street Princess Nut Nuts, the cruel nickname for Carrie Simmons that led to the downfall of Dominic Cummings. Uh, the Observer, attacks by PM's ousted aide, left new press chief in tears. This refers to Allegra Stratton, the Prime Minister's new press secretary, reportedly. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but I do think it's a bit... You know, to, who cares? You know, someone, uh, it happens to be a woman, maybe reportedly cried because of the, um, the tensions that existed within their workplace. It's fair, the, 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 the 
representation of women in powerful positions and crying uh, is really awful by some of the newspapers. And I think that front page headline actually on the on the Sunday Mirror is is misjudged, just to go with the nickname that's given to Carrie Simmons in a picture of Carrie Simmons. I don't think that's particularly well judged at all. Um, a little earlier on in the programme, I spoke with the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, George Eustace, to talk about the apparently toxic atmosphere in Number 10. Take a listen. There's obviously been some toxic briefings, uh, but fundamentally what's happened here is... You think everything's OK in there? Well, look, there's been um, obviously an episode that um, partly could have been a, a disagreement over certain roles. And that's the prerogative of any prime minister to be able to choose their advisers. Uh, in any prime minister's office, there are three key roles. You've got a chief of staff who uh, needs to try to uh, do the engagement and is usually quite cautious and tries to keep people well, happy. Well, we haven't seen that. I mean, this is a guy, Donald Cummings, who apparently, who apparently mimes throwing grenades into rooms that he's leaving and ignores the Prime Minister's texts and gloats about it. That's a... You must be astonished well, look, to read that. I've not immersed myself in the gossip. I've read it, yes. I don't know whether it's true or not true. But look, Dominic Cummings... You have no understanding of, of the workings of Number 10 right now, as a cabinet I minister. do understand. So you have three key roles, I'm saying, a chief of staff... Uh, then you have a director of strategy, and that's the role that Dominic Cummings has been performing. And those people are really to make sure that you've got some strategic purposes to government. It's not their job to uh, build bridges or mend fences or uh, engage with Parliament. That's something that the chief whip does. And then you have a, mm. a press secretary role, which is also the, the key third role in any prime minister's office. So the prime minister's now got to replace all three of those, and uh, he's got to have a, a balanced... Um, mix of those three they'll all be the temperamentally very different individuals of the prime minister's fiance as princess and nut nuts i mean this is this is school ground stuff secretary of state this is embarrassing for a number 10 that is dealing with the biggest peacetime crisis this country has faced well as i said i've not immersed myself in um the gossip of this and who called who what names whether people were upset or whether they cried you know from my point of view as a cabinet minister there's been an episode involving personnel uh, at number 10 the prime minister has taken a decision that he wants to change mm. the balances of advisors but you know this is about advisors to the prime minister it is not uh, well, let me not ask you about, about the government. decisiveness yeah let me ask you about decisiveness just finally because the claim is that boris johnson is indecisive that a decision gets made one minute and then he wanders back up to the downing street flat and it gets undone the next um, what, what decision has the government made that it has stuck to in the last few months? There will be well, many, many decisions that, uh, that we've made and that we've uh, stuck to. Um, we've made a decision to, to do this latest lockdown and we're sticking to that. Uh, and that will last. Having until previously the said that a lockdown December. wasn't going to happen, that he, would, he couldn't countenance a second lockdown. He changed on that big time. It, it changed on that because the situation changed, uh, but we've now got that lockdown until uh, the but second... The Prime Minister is decisive, right? He's a, he's a man who knows his mind and sticks to it. Yes, um, he is, and uh, uh, he does Which make is interesting because, again, like on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph, sorry to interrupt, but plans to unleash a new generation of homes across England using an ill-conceived algorithm are being overhauled amid the threat of seismic rebellion by Conservative MPs. That's Robert Jenrick's plan. That's being torn up. I see that the idea of uh, the TV licence changing for uh, under-75s has been postponed. This is on the same day that the Prime Minister is, you say, decisive. Doesn't look very decisive. Uh well, uh, I think he is. And like all prime ministers, he's been making lots and lots of decisions all the time, and particularly uh, at a very difficult time with the pandemic. That is an evolving, moving situation where sometimes, yes, you have to change tack and, ad and adapt your approach to deal with an emerging situation. But on um, uh, you know, all of the other uh, key areas, I mean, let's uh, uh, take leaving the EU. Uh, he was clear that we would leave, that we would leave at the end of this year, clear that we would not extend the transition period, and we didn't. Clear that we would, uh, we clear would, be that we would leave with or without an agreement, and we will. That's the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, George Eustace, speaking to me a little earlier on in the programme. Uh, there's a suggestion by an unnamed Downing Street aide that the Prime Minister is going to be gone within 12 months. They don't think their boss will be here uh, by this time next year, which might say something about, about loyalty in Number 10 right now. Uh, we'll talk about Trump in a few moments too. He's clinging on in there in the White House, still fighting the election results, saying that there were ballots cast illegally in places around the country. We'll get an update from a former communications director for or Trump's previous transition team in just a few moments' time. Tom Swarbrick here, 12.31, news headlines. Here's Tim Humphrey.
A government minister says Number 10 is working well following the departure of Dominic Cummings. George Eustace says the Prime Minister will remain decisive about key issues, including Brexit and the coronavirus pandemic, despite the loss of his leading adviser. Labour's calling for new laws to tackle conspiracy theories about coronavirus vaccines. It wants penalties for social media platforms which allow misinformation to spread. The head of the UK's team negotiating a trade deal with the EU says some progress has been made in recent days. Earlier, the Irish Foreign Minister said things need to move this week. The weather, blustery showers moving northeastwards with persistent rain in Northern Ireland and South East England, a high of 11. This is LBC. This is LBC, Swarbrick on Sunday, with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. This is interesting from Mike here on 84850. Tom, I attempted to take part in one of the, tri- the trials, the vaccine trials, and failed my screening. I was referred to my GP and it turned out to be nothing. This proved to me that the trials are being run properly, as if they were rushing, they would have just let me through onto the trial, says Mike. Come back to that in just a few moments' time. I want to turn to the US... 
Uh, for the next few moments, speak to Brian Lanza, former communications director for the Trump transition team. As overnight, there are protests in Washington, D.C. that turned a bit ugly. And as President Trump has put his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, in charge of the campaign's long-shot post-election legal challenges. Thank you for being there for us, Mr. Lanza. Um, how are the legal challenges going? How, how many successes have you had? Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, well, the campaign has had zero successes uh, from direct lawsuits, but uh, you also seen last night, uh, you know, a court in California ruled that Gavin Newsom's involvement in changing the election rules in California were unconstitutional. So whereas you don't have a lot of direct uh, victories from the Trump campaign, you have other people who are challenging the authority of the governor's response to COVID and they're being found unconstitutional in various states now. Do you think that what we're going to see now is actually Trump fight this personally using his personal team of lawyers, people like Rudy Giuliani, but actually step away from suggesting that the entire election was done fraudulently and the result could be changed? You know, I don't think anybody expects the result to be changed. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, people have voted. Rudy judged, Giuliani but, does. <laughs> uh, sure, but I mean, OK, uh, that's one person <laughs> in, in a country of 350 million. But like I said, the vast majority of the country doesn't think uh, the, the election is going to be undone or any votes are going to be thrown out. I think what the campaign, what President Trump is looking for is to say is to say, hey, listen, you know, the rules were changed in the middle of a, in the middle of the game. That's unfair. Uh, and now you've had courts that come forward and say, yes, the governors did not have this authority to change the rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, that probably sets him up for a strong run in 2024. Do you think when you were on Trump's transition team into the White House, do you think um, that the team that you met in Barack Obama's people who aided to that transition, do you think the, the Trump team are going to be similarly helpful to the Biden team as they transition into the White House? You know, I would hope so. Uh, you know, you've you've seen some some slow response to that, uh, but I would hope at some point, uh, you know, both uh, camps start to stock uh, because it's important that our transition be as seamless as possible. There's a lot of national security risks at stake Massively. that uh, I think people need to put things aside and, and integrate as quickly as possible. Not least for for the rollout of of any particular COVID vaccine, uh, which is coming uh, coming at a time of transition, uh, it's it doesn't seem yet that the Trump team is being necessarily all that helpful about allow allowing Joe Biden's team into national security briefings. That needs to change, doesn't it? I, I think it will change. I think you'll see a lot more senators speak up next week and say it needs to change while these challenges go forward, since nobody expects the election results to be overturned, uh, and it should change. Uh, but you know, keep in mind the the. The, the plans have already been set and you don't need, you know, Joe Biden will play, his administration will play a limited role into the rolling out of these vaccines because these plans have been set, you know, three to four months ago. They'll get a glimpse of it and they'll maybe, you know, ask for a change. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, by the time Joe Biden's sworn in the office, these plans are going to be in full effect. As a reminder that there is still quite a sizable Trump base in the United States. We saw these um, MAGA marches again, uh, which w there was uh, quite a lot of violence at, particularly in Washington, D.C. I wonder what you make of what we saw last night. You know, listen, I would say during the day, you saw a lot of peaceful protesters, you know, the MAG supporters. But in the evening, as, uh, as the left, uh, as the Antifa, as the BLM people came forward, you know, they always come out at night because uh, that's what cowards tend to do. And uh, you saw a lot of you saw a lot of violence on that part. It's a shame. You I mean, I wish we could have repeated the type of uh, performance we had during the day where there was no violence whatsoever. But unfortunately, you have a, a side, you know, very fascist side that doesn't like free speech, that doesn't like diverse opinions and that mm -hmm. uh, that covers their faces up and just attacks innocent people. That'll that'll happen. Well, nobody, yeah, nobody wants to see violence at all. Uh, from from which, whichever side it comes. But do you think it's that base that Mr. Trump is going to use to argue that he should be the Republican nominee for 2024? Listen, I think it's that base that, you know, President Trump's going to use to say, you know, Joe Biden's an illegitimate president. He, there's an asterisk. They changed the rules in the middle of the game. That's unfair. Courts have come back and said, yes, they've changed the rules, but there's no remedy at this point. And that base is going to be motivated and angry because they feel cheated in 2020. And uh, there is no... Do you think he's no going to be able to take senior Republicans with him on that wave of anger, though? I mean, Donald Trump can shout till he's blue in the face about it. And maybe there might be some uh, court rulings that suggest that, that in some areas he may, might have a a point. But he's not going to bring Mitch McConnell, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio for four years yes, saying, yes. hang on, this was stolen from me. He's not going to be able to do that. Yes, he is. A hundred percent he is. Donald Trump is the Republican Party today. Uh, you know, he, he puts a tweet, uh, a negative tweet to a Republican member, and they're no longer an elected official. So yeah, Donald Trump is the Republican Party. Uh, McConnell... Say that's despotism. 
Well, listen, it's uh, it's no different than when you know Barack Obama was the was the Democratic Party during his eight years. That's just the way it works. I mean, Barack Obama walked on water when he was presidency. Uh, so we'll see people say the same thing about Joe Biden. Our system is what it is, but uh, they you know the, they are the leaders of the party. Really good to talk to you. Thank you for speaking to us this morning, Brian Lanza, former commu- communications director for the Trump transition team worth watching some of what's been going on around uh, the transition and the people who are trying to get into the briefings to brief themselves up about national security considerations and how just how helpful the Trump administration is being or not, certainly over the course of the next few weeks. Here's Patricia in Uxbridge this afternoon on the subject of the vaccine. Hiya, Patricia. Oh, hi, Tom. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I, I get slightly uneasy when I start to hear scientists talk of the balance of probabilities and the probabilities of harm being less and the probabilities of benefit. And I think that's one of your scientists said earlier. Um, I, this sort of blind faith in science is, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, peer tested, peer reviewed. I mean, so were statins. And if you had a program on statins, you'd be bombarded by, you know, callers saying how they felt awful, they've been driven to suicide or near suicide. Um, and yet with statins, we can opt to sort of not take them. With a the vaccine, we can't. And I think your previous caller, the GP... The vaccine, you can. Um, you can opt not to take it. Uh, sorry, no, with, uh, well, they're talking about making it mandatory. So if they make it mandatory, we have to take that vaccine. Um, and, and you well, know, no, at and, the moment, Patricia, there is no suggestion that the government is going to make it compulsory. There is an there is an argument that says they've got the laws in place to be able to make it compulsory, and there might also be an ethical argument that says that it's the right thing to do. But I guess, Patricia, on the ethical side of it, you don't think it is. Uh, no, I no, certainly certainly not with the speed. You know, with your previous caller, the GP, you said we have not had midterm or long term. Uh, testing on this mm-hmm. and so you, you're still talking about bringing out something that hasn't it, it's been speeded up and i'm sure it's you know it, it, it's been speeded up with with efficiency in many ways but y- you cannot constantina something like this into just less than one year and and, and sort of how do you know on people i mean how, how do you know you, that you, you, how you do you don't know, that know you done? don't know i don't i don't know it can't be done but i don't know it cannot the opposite. <laughs> don't, you, you, <laughs> you don't know that it you can. <laughs> you don't know that but, it but can. Patricia, if, and and this, is where it, this is where it strikes me that it is so important um, for those who have concerns, understandable, I think, understandable concerns about the, the, the vaccination as it's currently being produced. Is there someone or something that could persuade you to take the vaccine and that it is safe, that the risks, uh, that the benefits outweigh the risks? Exactly, exactly. And, and that for that, you need information. And you also probably need to draw through misinformation. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely appalled that Labour are considering shutting down platforms that sort of like, even, even, even with misinformation. That just seems to me such a form of censorship that I, I'm just hanging my head in shame for them. And I just think, listening to this programme, as, as somebody that sort of erred on slightly probably more anti-vaccine, I've been sort of driven down the line of getting more and more belligerent hearing people talk about uh, this shutdown of information people that refuse to have a vaccination should sort of not be allowed to go abroad should not be allowed to fly should be isolated you know they're going to give us a bell next you know to ring before us to sort of it's, it's just uh, it, it, you, we really do we need a lot more information yeah Oh, and we need well, vaccination agree. Listen, I, to the, have been unrolled over a period of time because I, you were would, talking about war being the mother you. of invention. I mean, the last time I, I had a sort of concern over what I heard with the vaccine, apart from MMR, was the Gulf War and the booster vaccine mm. and the implications and the consequences of that. And, that, you know, that was unrolled. Well, listen, Patricia, the, you, are, you are right to say that the communication of the effectiveness and safety of this vaccine is absolutely crucial in getting enough people to to take it and to have it and to keep themselves and others safe. And, and really, they only get one opportunity to do this. I'm, I'm not even sure who they are right now. I don't think it can be led by the Prime Minister, because I'm not sure if, if we're talking about trust, I'm not sure that is there for the government right now for a whole range of reasons. So it's got to be done by someone or someone's got to be the face of it. Someone's got to lay out exactly what has happened and when and why it is safe in order for people like yourself to to trust in the process and to think it is safe for them. And they only get one opportunity to do that. So we're into really, really critical stages right now. Patricia, thank you. 0345 973 More of your calls to come. Plus, in just a few moments, the Royal Row on the Mail on Sunday. 
palace anger at TV's crown. Charles's friends call the drama trolling on a Hollywood budget. This is the new series of the Netflix hit The Crown, which I think, and I don't want you pers to persuade you to leave LBC for a moment, but I think it is now available to stream on Netflix, but that doesn't mean you should go and do it. That is not an incent. Don't go, don't go and watch The Crown, 12.46. Coming up at one on LBC, Majid Noirs. It's being revealed today that lobbyists have sent sensitive information on lockdown policy to paying clients. Will the departure of Cummings from government reveal cronyism in the Tory party? Majid Noirs on LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster on LBC. Afternoon to you, 10 to 1 is the time. Mary and Shepherds Bush are going to be next on the radio about the vaccine. But as you know, if you'd listened to this programme for some time, um, I'm incredibly boring. 
It's why I like to watch and spend my time watching documentaries about politics and, and history documentaries. It adds to my, my boring nature. Uh, but recently I've been watching so something on Netflix called Selling Sunset, which I won't explain what it's about, but it's absolutely terrific. And now I get the opportunity to binge The Crown, the new series that has hit Netflix, I think, this morning, gives you the opportunity to see what it might have been like inside the palace at various moments in relatively recent history. It is a documentary that has caused uproar in the real palace, not least amongst friends of Prince Charles, who have launched a blistering attack on The Crown, uh, accusing the producers of a uh, trolling on a Hollywood budget. Some of the prince's closest confidants have accused the streaming giant of exploiting the royal family's pain for financial gain and raged that fiction is presented as fact in its twisted version of events. Angela Levine is a royal biographer and royal commentator and joins me live on the programme. Angela, thank you for coming on. What period of history does this series of The Crown look at and why has it enraged the palace so much? It's 1979 to 1990. So that's all the problem with Diana and Charles's relationship. Um, and um, the Queen, uh, um, relations of uh, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, they were kept away from society because they were damaged in some way. They were sub-educational. And um, it's, it's all sort of negative and nasty and attacking uh, people who actually, on the whole, do their best for this country. Um, uh, you, have you seen the series? Or have you been I've able seen, to watch bits I've of it? I've seen all the series up to today. And I've yeah. seen... Um, chunks of the first part of this new series. I think the problem is that if you want to say that it's freewheeling and it's not fact, then you need to do that all the way through. But when you have things like um, Princess Diana, played by Emma Corrin, um, wanting to be really sick during the show so that people will understand what a terrible um, bulimia, what terrible, how terrible bulimia is, um, mm. then I think you have to be very careful of your other facts. I don't think you can have it both ways. The friends of Prince Charles have said, quotes, this is drama and entertainment for commercial ends being made with no regard to the actual people involved who are having their lives hijacked and exploited. Um, there is a fine line, well, and there should be quite a clear line between um, fiction and extemporising for the purposes of a story and a documentary, because this is not a documentary, is it? No, it's not a documentary. That's exactly what I mean. If it was, then um, I think you could have people being sick, but I don't think you should do that when um, it isn't. And I think also that you can't just take one line on a person. I mean, Prince Charles has is shown no redeeming features whatsoever. I spent a year with him before... That's in The Crown rather than in real life, right? In The Crown, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, just um, I spent a year with him um, before his 70th birthday, and he was utterly charming and very caring and very fastidious. And although he obviously changed because the marriage with um, Diana was such a disaster, I don't think you should make the future king of this country to look like an absolutely nasty piece of work. Angela, good to talk to you. Thank you. Angela Levine, royal biographer, royal commentator might stick to watching Selling Sunset. I've only got the last bit of series three to go. I mean, it is just, if that, if that isn't real life, I will be absolutely fuming. Mary's in Shepherd's Bush. Hi there, Mary. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm very well. Tell me about the vaccine and your fears. Um, well, I'm the mum to a 14-year-old, and um, I suppose the fears, my fear was, I was listening to one of your callers, um, the lady with the disabilities, and she was saying how... Yes. You know, everything is in such a sort of state in the payments with the government. And I suppose, it, you know, I'd been reading something in the paper and I suddenly thought, well, you have every right to be worried because the um, the Department of Work and Pensions lost their fight um, over the case that the GP was talking about with the um, swine flu and the narcolepsy. Mm. Um, and apparently, you know, they lost the case. Um, and even, even when they have had to pay out, because they have to pay out for the life of the child that's been damaged. Um, I think the pay the payout was just sort of twelve thousand pounds. So you're concerned was, about responsibility here, that yeah. no one's taking responsibility. 
yeah, you know, if something happens, and also if we all have this, if everyone has this, like I'm not an anti-vaxxer, I've had all my child's vaccines done. Um, but if we all have it, have it, we, we've got no money left. I mean, what will happen if something goes wrong? And it has gone wrong because there were the swine flu, isn't, isn't that kind of linked to, um, wasn't that linked slightly to the covid I, I, I'm not exactly sure. Was swine sure, flu linked to COVID? I don't. I don't think so in any way, shape, or form, Mary. But, but so it was. Um, it's three. It was three years prior to this. But um, anyway, these children did get narcolepsy, and the government have tried to wiggle out of it. It's a question of trust in the government, I suppose. It's what you were talking about before. Well, this is why. Yeah, this is why I. I don't think that. It's going to be the government that fronts the description of why this thing is safe and how this thing has been expedited safely in order that we can get our hands on it quickly. Because I think, Mary, and we were talking about it earlier, with things around Dominic Cummings, actually, trust in the government is has slightly evaporated. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel that. Yeah, um, and I don't know who then it is that, that does it. But Mary, thank you. I just want to squeeze in Ian before we hand over to Majid Nawaz this Sunday afternoon. Hi there, Ian. Hello, Tom. Uh, so, I would say it's governments and corporations that people don't trust rather than vaccines, which I think some of your callers have said. With zero accountability continuing, the pump public will simply not believe what they're being told. And why should they? Now, this is the fallout of the Blair government, and it's not going to go away. I personally will be taking Tony vaccine. Blair. <laughs> well, we, he's still wandering around, and Assange is in jail. So why should anybody oh, believe God, what they've Ian. been told? Assange, let's finish the show. Listen, the the uh, I, I would put no, I would put to you, Ian, that um, actually it is private companies, um, certainly in this case some of the pharmaceutical companies that absolutely deserve applause, praise, adulation for having been able to come up with a vaccine that, uh, on the face of it, is ninety percent successful in such quick time. I mean, that's I, I unbelievable. Be taking it. I will be taking it to protect But others. do you not think they deserve some credit rather than just to be maligned? Oh, they're bad because they're corporations. Oh, no. They, they, they try and make a profit. That therefore means that they're terrible people. We wouldn't have this thing without some of these companies. Well, I'm afraid their history is, is a little bit checkered if you, if you look into I'm it. I'm sure it is, but so is the history of, of, of public bodies too. Well, again, but neither of them have, have been made accountable, and that is the problem. I just, I, I don't. I'm afraid I don't. I, I disagree with you that public bodies aren't accountable. I don't think uh, government has been more accountable um, ever than at this stage. There are so many ways of, of holding government to account, and rightly so. Corporation, I agree, different matter. Let's see how transparent they're going to be about this process. Ian, we leave it there. Listen, thank you very much indeed for your call. Thank you for all your calls over the course of the programme. I am with you Monday night, Monday night, 10pm. Do join me then if you can. There's the global player for everything else. Ian Payne with you at four right now on LBC. Majid Nawaz. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Coming up, religion is the final frontier of personal prejudice with attitudes to faith driving negative perceptions more than ethnicity or nationality. Has religion become the new scapegoat for bigots? Before that, there was near universal agreement from scientists last week that the coronavirus vaccine breakthrough was hugely significant. Fears of vaccine enforcement, free speech skeptics uh, and uh, public take-up seems mixed. How do you feel about the COVID vaccine rollout? But first, one of Britain's most influential lobbyists secretly